hearing room, public safety, so I say public works. I don't know, I'm still stuck on public safety. <laughs> I want to welcome you all to City Hall. We have a rather interesting agenda today. It's going to require some cooperation on your part, and hopefully you can hear me clearly. The acoustics are not the best in this room. But I want to welcome you. I know it's very hard to find parking, get your way over here, and now we have you waiting. My deepest apologies. This is a committee of three council members. To form a quorum, I need at least one other council member. Now, I could proceed and go through the agenda, but it would be essentially a report from the chair to the council, which means all the public hearings would have to be re-established and have to conduct that again, but I understand. Oh, great. So, Councilman Weiss is on his way. So I'm speaking very slowly because I'm buying time. Today, we have a few items that I could speak to without a quorum. Item number one, it's a motion. Why don't you speak to number one, please, Roberto, our CLA representative. Uh, yes, Councilman, motion, uh, item one, rather, it's a motion Smith Gruel. It's instructing the planning department to prepare a report within 45 days that delineates the current procedures to create horse trails and to also develop standards that dictate when in the development process a horse trail is established and the specific triggering factors to establish horse trails and related matters. So what we will do is refer this to the planning department and request a report in 45 days given the intention of this motion. That will be to delineate the current procedures to create horse trails. My understanding that I believe it's item number seven has withdrawn the application. Yes, the application was withdrawn. Has been withdrawn. Mm -hmm. Can you just speak for the record, Roberto, on what is number seven? Uh, yes, Councilman, this, is, this was an appeal filed by Walter O'Brien and Josh Lichtenberg. Uh, they were uh, members of the Pacific West Views States Homeowners Association, and they had appealed the action of the West LA APC, which approved a parcel map for a maximum new two-parcel single-family development, and the project is located in CD11. Okay, so we will receive and file that item with the record. <clears throat> so folks, on item number seven, we have quite a few speaker cards. And is anyone here for item number seven? Okay, okay I, so. I was advised by the council office they have left. Well, they've left? Yes. Okay, so I just want to make sure there's no one here waiting for seven because it's not going to be heard, it's been received and filed, and we appreciate your cooperation there. So that takes care of number seven. As far as reports go, we will not have a report on item number 10, and we will not have a report on item number 11. We've been joined by Councilmember Weiss. Welcome, Councilmember. So now we can begin now that we have a quorum, the hearing process. Just a few notes. As you come up to the microphone, there is a clock right next to our clerk, which indicates two minutes. That's the time we are giving each speaker. Some of you have taken the time to write a real nice and coherent letter that might go over two minutes. So if you're going to read from a letter, please get to the point of your letter as soon as possible before you run out of time. 
So try to pace your presentation based on that. When you do come up, please give us your name and your address before you begin. So with that, Roberto, let's go with item number two and three. Sure, Councilman. Uh, item two is a report from the CAO. It's requesting approval of separate supplemental fee agreements with Thomas Properties Group, LP, for the Metro Universal Project and with Universal City Studios, LLP, for the Universal City Vision Plan. And also it's requesting uh, staffing to work on processes related to the projects pursuant to a motion of Blanche Reyes. This matter has also been referred to the Personnel Committee. Okay. So it's been heard or will be referred to? It will be referred, Council. Okay. So please introduce yourself and give us the uh, Reader's Digest version of two and three. Okay. John Foreman with the City Planning Department. Um, the items that you have before you are two separate items. Um, last April we had two council motions come in um, under council file 2007-0511 was a request for a supplemental fee agreement between the City of Los Angeles and Universal Studios. Under council file 2007-0507, which is item number three on your agenda, there was a separate motion for the city to enter into a supplemental fee agreement with Thomas Properties Group, um, again, for another supplemental fee agreement. The city planning department is requesting today that um, on item number two that the CAO's report in response to that motion be approved and um, in addition that the um, council ultimately exempt the positions contained in the supplemental fee agreement from the managed hiring procedures and policy of the 2008-2009 budget. In addition, on item number three, which is the um, supplemental fee agreement with Thomas Properties, we would recommend that um, the CAO report with regard to that motion be approved and um, that the motion in as much as the position authorities are requested and reflected in the CAO report for item number two that that's where they're addressed and that that's where they're combined. The, we also request that um, the council ultimately exempt the positions contained in the supplemental fee agreement with regard to Thomas Properties from the managed hiring procedures and policy for the 2008-2009 budget and refer the motion um, and the CAO's response to the personnel committee along with item number two. And just real quickly, just wanted to make it clear, I think there were some questions on the agenda. We do have two motions. We have a combined CAO report because the result is that through these two separate projects, they end up being revenue neutral on the general fund for processing purposes. But these are two separate projects, two separate motions that came in, and two separate responses. Okay. So we understand these are two projects that will share city staff resources. Correct. The city staff must commit to its due diligence and professional analysis object objectively as to how we deal with the various requests that are being made under these projects, correct? That is correct, Councilman. So we're going to include many of the options that are required through the CUPs, the EIR, the creation of a new specific plan, to name a few that are products that could come from this process. That is correct. The, um, the um, request for the Universal City Vision Plan would ultimately result in a city ordinance, a specific plan. That is the request. So we will be analyzing their request for a specific plan in addition to tentative track maps and, as you said, any conditional uses or zone changes, there's a possible annexation and detachment involved. So we'll be analyzing the application for those entitlements. So when we look at all the elements combined, we will consider different modes of transportation, different ways of creating relief, uh, mitigation, and we just happen to have major thoroughfares surrounding these projects as well as a riverway, correct? That is correct, Councilman. And they'll all be 
analyzed for the type of advantages and disadvantages, both from the community's perspective and the property owner's perspective? We will analyze them um, with regard to those issues and um, per the strategic plan of the city planning department and per the do real planning principles to, to look at those different interconnected issues. Well, I'm not trying to be coy here, but it's obvious we have certain opportunities that are viewed differently from different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And we just want to make sure we understand the impacts of these potential uses. And I hope we could be opportunistic with all the different choices we might have. And dealing with the, in as much the transit systems, the riverway, the bypass, and everything else that I think can cause relief and still have a great project. Okay. So, Councilor, do you have any comments? Well, for both eight, two, and three, knowing that uh, they're both separate projects, uh, I'd like to move that we approve, exempt the positions contained in the SFA from the managed hiring procedures and policy for the 2008-2009 budget year, and then we refer this to the personnel committee. And that would be true for a point of clarification. both two and three. Council member, it's uh, also the CO recommendations. There were a number of recommendations in the report. And as a point of clarification, I'd like to know if uh, exemption would also apply to fiscal year 09 or uh, 10, because I understand that we had the exemption for the 08 09. And if we should add that as part of the recommendation. Would the CEO like to comment or staff? Who would? Madeline Rackley with the CAO. We would be amenable to that. Okay. Is that okay, Barbara? All right. So that will be the action of this committee regarding items two and three. And I look forward to a great plan, an inclusive plan, and one that seeks to look at all opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Roberto, the next item. Uh, next item, Councilman, is item four. It's a report from the Cultural Heritage Commission relative to the inclusion of the Yamash of Yamashiro um, located at 199 Sycamore Avenue in CD4. Okay, do we have a staff report on this? I, I believe this is a consent item, Councilman. Oh, this is a good one. I believe there's a speaker card. Is there a speaker card on for you? Let check me check. Does that one have it circled? <clears throat> yes, we do have two speaker cards. So let's get a quick report from the staff on item number four. Do we have staff here for item number four? No. Okay, but let's do this. Okay, Michael. And he comes in his... Good morning, Councilman. Um, before you have a report from the Cultural Heritage Commission for the inclusion of this monument um, as a Yoshimura located at 199 Sycamore, and we request that you adopt the report. Okay. That being said, we have Christy McAvoy, as well as Brian Kern, I believe, like to come on up. Christy McAvoy and Brian Kern. <coughs> Good afternoon, council members. Um, if I may, I'd like to uh, reverse the order and have Brian Curran from Hollywood Heritage speak first. Fine with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll just read some, uh, a brief statement. Few buildings can claim the title of landmark from their very construction. Yamashiro, however, has laid claim to this status since 1914. From its prominent position over central Hollywood, Yamashiro has captivated the imagination and curiosity of generations of Angelinos. Its unique and expressive Japanese revival architecture is unmatched elsewhere in the city, its only rival having collapsed into the PCH decades ago. The tale of its evolution as a heritage site is the story of Hollywood. Among its roles were a show palace for art collectors, a public garden, a star-studded social club, a movie backdrop, a military school, a flop house, and finally the restaurant destination it is today. Yamashiro remains a living piece of Hollywood history continuously enjoyed by Angelinos and tourists alike. 
We at Hollywood Heritage urge the Commission to support the preservation of Yamashiro through awarding of the Cultural Heritage Monument status to ensure its protection so that it may continue in perpetuity to captivate, entertain, and educate the public about Hollywood's, Hollywood's long and colorful history. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Christy McElroy. Thank you. Council members, I represent the ownership of Yamashiro, who does not object to this nomination. Okay. Short and sweet. Thank you very much. All right. So we will move on this item. And um, designated and just uh, uh, approval, Councilman. Move approval. Yeah. Okay. That'll be our action. Next item. Uh, do you want to consider item six, Councilman? I believe you may have LAPD representatives for this item. Okay. Thank you. We also have about 40 people outside the door, council member, that want to be a part of this hearing. Um, okay. Do we want to let them in right now? It looks rather crowded. I don't know who, what, uh, what other items are here to be spoken. Okay. Six Come is on. a big one. We have a lot of folks want to speak, could we uh, announce their names and were they able to come in if they heard their name from the hallway? The ones for, that want to speak? Right. Yeah. Well, well, let's do this. Let's go through the case. Okay. Um, when we get to the public speaking, we'll call out their names. Um, but first I want to know if everyone feels compelled to speak uh, or if everyone can stand up and say I agree with that position. So let's take it one step at a time. We'll have the report first, and then I'm going to ask the uh, Sergeant Robin Brown to come up after the report. So Mr. Brown, please wait. So let's have the planning staff come forward. Sure. Uh, Councilman item six is an appeal by Mr. Chaudhry. It's on behalf of Dallas Market Inc. doing business at Seven Kings Liquor. Uh, they're appealing the decision of the zoning administrator that found that the liquor store constituted a nuisance and the appellant is appealing various conditions. And the CA is present. Yes, good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. My name is Annick Charon. I'm the zoning administrator of record for this, um, for this review. Um, I am having a couple of uh, documents, uh, mainly photographs, uh, uh, distributed to your committee so that you have a better uh, idea of the location of the, of the property. The property is located uh, at the intersection of Martin Luther King and Limerick Boulevard in the West Adams uh, community. In uh, April of 2007, uh, the director of planning uh, attended a town hall meeting in that community where numerous complaints were brought against this location as well as several other locations uh, selling uh, alcohol and resulting in uh, substantial impacts on the community. Uh, the number of impacts included um, uh, loitering, public drinking, verbal threats, uh, robbery, property damage, battery, and accumulation of trash. Um, the city, uh, with the director of planning, um, started a uh, revocation procedure to investigate uh, the allegations which were made against this and other properties, but we're looking only at uh, this one for the time being. Um, the, after holding a hearing, um, at the hearing, I had both opposition and support for the, for the project as it is right now. The applicant, as probably um, either the applicant or his representative will present, acquired the property in June 2006. A lot of the impacts were happening prior to the acquisition of the property of the business by this current operator. However, uh, LAPD reports um, were submitted showing still impacts due to the sale of alcohol uh, at this location, even though the situation had drastically improved. So, um, not revoking the use, uh, what I did So, is I want to make sure uh, I heard that correctly. What you just said is that, although they have improved, the conditions still exist. 
uh, it exists at a much lighter, much lighter uh, impact. I mean, but I still have, as part of the file, I mean, the file is, I think, with your right. committee, a number of uh, police reports uh, showing still uh, impacts from the sale of alcohol and hours of operation at this uh, location. Okay. So rather than revoking the use immediately, what I did is impose a number of conditions, some of which are already uh, put into effect by the, um, by the applicant. Uh, so the applicant is appealing a number of uh, conditions, and I will go uh, very briefly. It's not going to take too much time. I understand that you have a lot of um, um, uh, testimony to hear. Um, the first uh, condition that the applicant or the operator is appealing is the limit on hours of operation. The current hours of operation are from 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, I limited them to 7 a.m. to 12 midnight, uh, consistent with another revocation case which I had that very day, where the operator himself volunteered to a 12 midnight uh, limitation of time, saying that that was feasible. Uh, so. Um, uh, that is how I uh, impose this. Uh, for your information, and you have that if you have read uh, the appeal of um, the um, operator, the operator is planning apparently uh, to transfer the store to a 7-Eleven franchise. And even though the 7-Eleven uh, Corporation uh, originally got its name from its hours of operation from 7 to 11, it has now for many years operated on a 24-hour basis. And my concern in maintaining the hours of operation as I have right now uh, is mainly to prevent uh, such a site to operate 24 hours. And I know the sale of alcohol would not go beyond 2 a.m., I mean, per state law, but still we would have uh, possible impacts in the future from extended hours of operation. The second condition that the operator is appealing is my imposition of a state licensed security guard who may not be an employee of the business. Um, the uh, operator is saying that uh, he is currently utilizing a state licensed security guard who is an employee of the business. And the reason why I'm asking that the uh, guard not be an employee of the business is that if the guard is an employee of the business, he or she will have other responsibilities and, and other duties and is not going to be able to really pay full attention to the, um, to the security on the site. Uh, the hours for the guard which were not appealed as for from dusk to closing time. Condition number 21 is appealed also by the operator where um, a standard procedure that I have when a problem, uh, when a site or an operation has been a problem or may become a problem, I impose a condition uh, mandating a plan approval review with a public hearing if there are any problems in the future associated with the operation of, uh, of the business at this location. I'm relatively surprised that uh, that condition is being appealed in as much as if there are no problems uh, whatsoever with the operation, uh, the procedure is not going to apply. The city will not ask the applicant to come for a um, um, uh, plan review. Uh, for your information, the coalition, the community coalition, is usually asking for a set date, a one-year plan review. Uh, considering the improvement that had been taking place under this operator, I did not feel that it was necessary to, um, to mandate a one-year review, and I um, imposed the condition that a review would be mandated only if new problems occur at this location. And finally, the, the last condition being appealed is that uh, the business owner reimburse the city of an amount of $2,662. Uh, $2 this is pursuant to section 1901P of the code to reimburse the city uh, for the cost that it has incurred uh, investigating uh, the operation of the business at this location. So my recommendation is that your committee maintain the conditions um, as uh, imposed at this time. 
Have you had the opportunity to see the letter from the council office and the conditions that they were proposing? Uh, yes, I did receive a letter which is in the, uh, in the file. And, and uh, in the letter, I think if I remember well, the councilman was recommending uh, 1 a.m. closing time. I, I would have right, to yes, verify right. that. Is that it was not major? going as far as midnight. That's the major difference? Uh, I think that's what it was. Yes, yes, it is 1 a.m. that that was being recommended. But my question to you, is that the biggest difference between the two recommendations? Um, as far as my recollection goes, yes. Okay. Why don't Roberto get a copy of the letter from the council office? And okay. To, oh, to, to the give a, yeah. Okay. Okay. I think there's one other condition, covenant agreement, the covenant agreement condition. Uh, that was not appealed. Uh, I'm sorry, I was reading from the letter that I received uh, as part of the attachment uh, uh, package and uh, I did not have that, but I'm uh, being uh, told that the um, operator is also appealing uh, the record, my condition to amend it, the recordation of a covenant and agreement running with the land. This is a standard condition that we impose uh, in order to make sure that when uh, the land or an operator changes uh, hence, the future operator or the future owner is aware that those conditions apply to that use on that property. And I okay. recommend that this be maintained. If we have any more questions, we'll ask you to come back. Thank you. Okay. Um, only because we like to have our police personnel out in the field and not uh, in these halls, I'd like to ask our uh, officer to come up before the appellant, if I may. So please come on up, sir. Good afternoon, uh, Councilman. My name is uh, Sergeant Robin Brown. I'm currently assigned to uh, Southwest Division, where I'm employed as the uh, Vice Coordinator. Um, the uh, premises in question uh, is within the confines of Southwest Division. Uh, it would be our position that the uh, current conditions that are in effect should remain in effect. And uh, in particular, uh, Condition 10, uh, the issue with the uh, state license security guard. Thank you. OK, so very concise. Keep the conditions as is. Yes, sir. OK. Let me ask you, has the change, has it changed any from one owner to the next? Uh, I believe it has. I think uh, there's been uh, some significant improvements at that location. Uh, I would uh, venture to say that the conditions uh, have probably played a substantial role in the improvement, and we'd like to see the uh, situation uh, remain as it is or improve. To maintain yes, sir. the progress that you've seen so far. Okay. Any questions? Thank you very much, Sergeant. Thank you. Okay, let's hear from our appellant, and that would be uh, Mr. Trudery. Moiden Trudery is the appellant, would like to come on up? Yes, sir. You are the owner of the yes. establishment? Yes, sir. And you would like to see the conditions changed? Yes, sir. Okay. So, I, I understand the emotional relief here because we actually got to sit down in the chambers, but uh, sir. We, we are trying to stay focused on the substance and the facts. And so I appreciate your emotional outburst there. but. Please give us your name and address yes. and the reasons for your appeal. Okay. My name is Mohiuddin Chaudhary. Can you speak into the microphone so we can hear you better? My name is Mohiuddin Chaudhary and my address is store address 4051 Lemart Bluebird, Los Angeles 90008. Okay. Now, can you tell us why you're appealing? Okay. It's, first of all, I'm just a new owner. I just is uh, working in my liquor store almost two years. In between, I don't have any problem, no gang bang, no shooting, no loitering, and 
no is uh, is robbery because my store when i just owned uh, like 97 actually 96 end of the time and that time i have just one problem one guy he i believe he's here he has mental problem he's trying to is talk to me is bad word and he throw my face is like shelf that's why i call the police two times that's the reason is that is problem is coming my head i believe is he has mental problem he can come to my store he can go anybody to trying to tell him to i kill you or something but i i just when i get it store i improve my store because i spoke with community collusion i spoke with neighborhood chariot club is miss anna i spoke with other community everybody whatever they told me i can do it that way and then is i have another 711 is it was liquor store to i make a 711 711 is i can explain you 711 is food store i love it i like it because my neighborhood everybody like it 711 look please so continue go ahead seven and this is store i selling now 90% liquor and 10% food if i make a 711 that means i can sell is 10% alcohol and 90% food because i have here one, one is floor plan you can see your honor i will give it to you later and here say only three shelf they can 711 provide me for alcohol that means two shelf for liquor and one shelf is small four feet each one but, but let me ask you one question why couldn't you open up a 711 with the conditions not with condition because 711 if i make a 711 is then is i can open 7 to 2 in the morning is better that's why you know is because if i make a 711 that is nice clean good and is i sell food 90 percent alcohol is 10 percent that's why i just trying to making 711 they already approved is 711 market manager mr mike is here and real estate manager mr paul is here so i have uh, some documents and i have is like two three hundred people they already signed it and here almost hundred people is they come with me they trying to support me i can make it con with the 711 without okay. our condition so your honor you the one who has justice and i believe is some people is with you uh, in right and left side i can tell everybody i just trying to help from my neighborhood from city from justice so is even i don't like 7 eleven i don't like liquor store because liquor store is whatever i opens from 7 in the morning to 2 in the morning too many problem too many people too many things and 7-Eleven, I have other 7-Eleven, nice, clean, good. And we sell is food. 7-Eleven, all I say 7-Eleven food store, not liquor store. Okay. So that's why I just, my request, I have somebody here, so many people, almost 100 people, whatever you see okay. is like Thank you, Mr. everybody Mayor. trying to help me. So is if he wants to. Is there anything new or different you want to say? Can you finish? Are you finished? Sir, is, that means is, I like to, sh you guys show me his banner. Everybody his. show his ladder, ladder, 7 11 one. Everybody show 7 11. Let's do this. Thank you very much. Just, just to be clear, those are, just a minute, just a minute. Just a minute, folks. Those who are supporting, Mr. Chudori, please stand. Who's supporting me? Please stand. Honor say you can stand. Okay. Thank you very much. You can sit down. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chudori. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. So, okay. And 
I can okay. I can give it to some documents for you guys. Okay. Still, I I have a last question. Seven Eleven is whatever I have liquor store. I have like is I am behind for payment because is now no business, no nothing. You know, financial situation is very bad. Yeah, In between, you. I have SBA loan. I have documents. I owe them almost ninety thousand dollars. So I trying to help. If I make a Seven Eleven, I already spoke with them. They give me opportunity. I can pay back there slowly, slowly. So, Your Honor, I need to justice from you guys. If I make a Seven Eleven, thank you, Mr. Rubin. Please give me opportunity. I can thank make you. it, thank and no much. condition. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, folks. We have a long list of speakers. And I have about three more items on the agenda that we need to attend to. So I'm going to be asking that we cut it down to one minute. If there's anything new you have to add, please share your thoughts with us. If you agree with the previous speaker, if you have nothing else or different or new to add, you can just say, I agree with the previous speaker. Okay? So I appreciate that. So let's go through this list because you can see we have a hefty stack here. We'll try to get through this as fast as possible. Alfredo Washington. After Alfredo, you can come on up and start forming a line. Ms. Betty Drawn, D-R-A-U-G-H-A-N. And then Kevin Fleming. Please come on up. Ms. Washington, please give us your name and address. My name is Alfreda Washington. I'm at 4121 Fifth Avenue. I'm in direct opposition to the previous speaker. I have to live in that area. So I'm asking that this committee please support the conditions, the positions that are already in place. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next speaker. Please come on up, give us your name and address. Hello, Betty Drawn representing the Community Coalition AT101 Vermont. I'm in favor of 7-Eleven also, but I'm old enough to remember the original 7-Eleven, okay. and I don't think it had liquor. So hopefully, this 7-Eleven will go back and pick up the old way of 7-Eleven. I have a letter I want to submit. I won't bother to read it, but thank now, you. Now, do you, do you support the conditions? Pardon? Do you support the, the conditions? Condition? Well, I can make a statement. Uh, all of the conditions at 7-Eleven is requesting to change are important for the community in our battle against crime and substance addiction. We met with the business operator, Mr. Dallas, last month and have committed him to the importance of these conditions. At this meeting, he agreed to compliance review. Okay, I think Councilman Weiss would like to say anything. You remember the original 7-Eleven? You remember the original 7-Eleven? Microphone? No, I'm oh. old enough to remember. Oh. Because I... <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Okay. <laughs> All righty then. Okay, Kevin Fleming? Yes, uh, Kevin Fleming, um, 4079 Creed Avenue, Los Angeles, California, 90008. I'm a community friend of this man right here. He's done a great thing for the community, and I ask that you turn a negative into a positive. I mean, a liquor store or a 7-Eleven, come on, it doesn't add up. I think that the 7-Eleven would be more of a, of a local neighborhood store instead of a liquor store, as far as like a Starbucks that's down the street and so on and so on. That's all I have to say, but I really ask that you turn it into a 7-Eleven, and I agree with all or everything else. Okay. okay. Uh, Mrs. Norris, R. Bird, Robert Rubio, and Julia Ansley. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Mrs. Norris Bird. Uh, I wish when we think in terms of building these things in our neighborhood, we would think in terms of building something educational. 
it's good sometimes to have these stores. I know about probably all the 7-Eleven over South LA and up in Northern California. But I don't know anyone that's really owner of uh, four or five people's work in these stores. If they were thinking in terms of doing something educational to help their community, to build up to the community, this is not nothing but just like a mom and pop store. This is the way all of the stores are. They are owned by the Middle Eastern, and they only are family operated. And when it come down to saying about the liquor and all of this kind of stuff, the fresh fruit and stuff, we need nutrition. We need so many things. If we would have done something several years ago, we wouldn't have the medical conditions we have today. Thank Since you. we have them, we're going to be dealing with a lot more problems. Thank you, Ms. Burke. Thank you. Thank you very much. Robert Rubio and then Julia Ansley. Then we'll have Alexander M. I believe it's Pavia Kento. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak. Um, Lemur Park is a neighborhood of national importance from an urban planning standpoint, from a cultural standpoint, for all of the African American families, Japanese American families, and in my case, my grandfather moved to Lamert area in the 1920s. We've worked hard to protect this neighborhood. And as a small business owner, I respect the gentleman has bills to pay, but he shouldn't have to pay his bills at the expense of our property values, at the expense of us being able to get good tenants because of activities that go on at these type of locations. Currently, at each major gateway into Lamert Park, there is a liquor store. So, I represent the Save Lamert Neighborhood Coalition, the Lamert Boulevard Block Club, and we strongly, strongly endorse these conditions and support our councilmen and support the police with these restrictions. Thank you. Thank you. Julia Ansley. My name is Julia Ansley. Uh, my address is 3828 Sutro Avenue, Los Angeles, 9008. And I'm a longtime resident of Lamert Park, and I'm also a community activist involved with the Save Lamert Coalition. I'm also involved with the Community Coalition, and I'm involved with our Neighborhood De uh, Development Council. The main thing, point that I want to make is I'm 100% in favor of the conditions because we have liquor stores practically on every corner. Lamert Park has become a mecca for people who just want to come and hang out get drunk, show out. We have a lot of street crime. We have a lot of burglaries. Liquor stores always bring with them a magnet. They, they, they attract people who don't have any real good in the community. And I'm speaking as a homeowner. A lot of these people who are speaking, they're not homeowners. They don't work in the neighborhood. All they do is come in the neighborhood and drink and hang out. So we need these conditions imposed. Thank you very much. Please, uh, please, let's show some courtesy, please. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm, I'm the attorney and filed the application for uh, Mr. Chowdhury. I wish uh, you would have spoken I, when he spoke, but go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted, I'll be real brief. I wanted to first directly address the question that you asked regarding why can't 7-Eleven come in right. if the conditions remain. Very simply, and, and there are two gentlemen here from 7-Eleven that could confirm this, out of roughly 8,000 7-Elevens that they have, only about a half dozen close as early as midnight. And they were essentially grandfathered in from before. 7-Eleven's uh, deal is that they have a reputation as a franchise that they have a lot of interest in protecting, that they're open all the time. If not 24 hours, then very, very late. So they're not really interested in investing in a company that wants to build a 7-Eleven that isn't going to be open uh, all the time. So that's just a direct answer to the question that was previously asked. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to just stress here is I, I think there's a lot of good points that are made. There certainly are a lot of liquor stores in that community, probably more than they're necessary. Uh, this particular gentleman is going to run, can I go a few more seconds? Please. This particular gentleman is going to run the store, I think, better than most. And the main thing to keep in mind is that you're all here doing a job policing, you know, in, in essence, people that are running the store. You know, it's your job to make sure that things are as good as they possibly can be. Well, 7-Eleven has a franchise to protect. So you have some guarantee that for Mr. Chowdhury, who's invested almost a million dollars in this thing, he's going to want to keep 7-Eleven in his good graces to not break his contract with them, 
which guarantees that there's going to be a minimum standard there of it's the 7-Eleven likes to keep. It's going to be clean. It's going to be well lit. There's going to be a security guard. Without you needing to come in or the police needing to come in, they're going to make sure that that's the case. If not, they're going to tear apart his franchise. He's going to lose a lot of investment. He's going to lose his life savings. So I think that gives at least some additional incentive to keeping a 7-Eleven versus some other liquor store. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Anna Burns, Anna Burns, Kim Priestley, Priestley, and George Graham, and then Ma Maria Isabel Rutledge. My name is Anna Burns. I'm a mem I live in Lamert Park. I'm with the Cherrywood Lamert Block Club. We did submit a letter from the Block Club opposing the conditions in full. There's a letter from the Fifth Avenue Block Club was also submitted imposing the conditions. The store needs to have conditions on it because it's an eyesore and it's a heartbreak. As you enter the beautiful, historic family community of Lamert Park, there is a liquor store, Seven Kings. It's kitty corner from two churches, one with the school, the Transfiguration Church. It's a few blocks down from Audubon School and surrounded by churches and schools. And what it sells is alcohol, which has a negative impact on all the residents and people going to the various churches and facilities. I testified at the hearing as to trash and debris at the site. I testified to going to the store and seeing inebriated people in the store buying alcohol in the middle of the day blocking the entrance, drinking against the wall, drinking in cars. That type of activity still happens, and that's why the conditions are necessary. Condition five is especially... Okay, thank you. Oh. Please give us your, what you have in writing. Thank you. Next, please. Kim Priestley. Hi. Please, folks, let's show some courtesy. Yes. Hi, I'm Kim Priestley. I'm the vice president of the Fifth Avenue Block Club. I made a field trip to Mr. Dallas 7-Eleven on Venice. He sells singles, malt liquor, half pints, pints, malt, um, the miniatures, and the pop wines. There's a 7-Eleven on Coliseum and King that sells no liquor. There's also a 7-Eleven on Angela Vista and Slauson that sells no singles, no half pints, no pints, no miniature, or pop liquor. We're asking to have a true 7-Eleven, not one that is a glorified liquor store. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm George. I'm with Community Coalition, 8101 South Vermont. We, Please too, please. oppose uh, the appeal. Please go, uh, Mr. Graham. We, too, oppose the appeal of the conditions. We want to conditions to remain. Uh, I did speak with uh, Dallas, as I know him, and uh, we talked to, in, in reference to uh, how they can make it better if it becomes a 7-Eleven. I <clears throat> believe the community would be well served if it becomes a 7-Eleven and adheres to uh, the improvement that he had put forth as versus uh, a 90% uh, alcohol to a 10% alcohol sales, uh, the 90% uh, food sales, this would be an improvement for the community and the residents. But also you have to keep in mind that right now conditions are imposed on the land because of what's taking place. So that's, that's why until that improves, the conditions should remain. And 7-Eleven has the ability to take that in consideration and make this community uh, uh, please a please with another 7-Eleven. So I thank you for your comment. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Next speaker. Excuse me. Oh. Excuse me, sir. I like to say I didn't plan on being here. That's why I'm here with the short pants. I'm actually going out of order because I have to go to work. Um, my name is Mr. Mead. I live at 3951 Third Avenue. I agree with everything this gentleman had to say, and I think it would be a great idea to have a 7-Eleven to have more variety as far as nutritious choices and not have people just rely on something to drink. And we hope we can keep it open until 2 a.m. And I agree with everything he had to say, and I got to go. Did you write fill out a card? I did. My name is up there. My name is Russell Mead. Russell. I, I had to go out of order because I have to go to work. Okay, no problem. Thank you much. Thank you. Ms. Rutledge. Good morning. My name is Maria Isabel Rutledge, and I'm here representing the Community Coalition, 90th Plus Block Club. I'm with the Neighborhood Council, and I would like you to please, uh, I, I would like to see Mr. Uh, Chaudhary 
adhere to the to the conditions placed. This would show that he has respect for our community. <coughs> Homeowners, um, blood clubs, churches, community organizations, we've been working very hard to bring up the uh, quality of life in our community for our children and for our safety. And uh, his uh, appeal shows a great lack of respect for, the, for our community. And I'd like to see, I'd like to know, I'd like you to know that we as community members uh, from these organizations are here free. For our time is, uh, we're taking time off of our busy time. Uh, he's paying people, I'm sure, Thank you to much. be here. And that's, uh, Thank you. that's quite a difference. Thank you very much. Please vote. All right, the following speakers, we have uh, Kristen L. Hunnam, Scott Campbell, and Carl McJemson. Kristen L. Honey, Scott Campbell, and Carl McJemson. Please come on up. Give us your name and address. Yes, sir. My name is Kristen L. Honey. And I live at 1840 West uh, 25th Street. But uh, I'd like to say that uh, he's a good man, as far as I know. I have never had any problems going to the liquor store or anything. And uh, I agree with him as to no conditions, you know, and uh, keep the 7 Eleven. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Hi, right, my name is Carl McJimson. I'm a blizzard steer. I've seen the store, I work at the store. It's a good thing to have it the time that it's open to 2 o'clock in the morning. I think it's a good idea to at least try to have something where we can have a place before that time where we can go to a store in the community. It's not the fault to where we're trying to make things bad in the community, but there's the only store, and if you can give a good try, I'm pretty sure for the time limit to 2 in the morning would work. And it would be a good try because we have been maintaining a good, clean property and the store without any problems, and it does work. And if we just had to try, the chance, it wouldn't be no problem in the community. And your name again? Carl McJimson. Thank you, sir. I'm Scott Campbell. I'm here to speak on item number eight. Okay. Scott number Campbell, if we, if we could just stop clapping so we can hear the, the names, I'd appreciate it very much. But please go ahead. I'm here to speak on number eight, not number six. Scott okay. Campbell. All right, so we'll hold on to that. These are all number eight. Okay, number six. Okay, we have uh, Christopher Moreno, George Trejo, and Jeffrey Hambrick. Please come on up. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Christopher Moreno, 5833 Gonzalo Avenue. Uh, I've been going to the store for a very long time now. They've been... Can you speak into the microphone? Uh, I've been going to the store for a while, and I used to be a resident of the area. I moved away, and I still continue to go. Um, I think your zoning board and LAPD said it themselves. Everything has improved. So if it's improved, why steady stick with the conditions? You want to improve the community? Yes, there is a liquor store a lot in Lamar Park. He's trying to change it. Mr. Chowdhury's not trying to change that and remove a liquor store and put in a 7-Eleven. If that doesn't help the community any better, you're here for the community's best interest. Your community's here telling you what they want. It's a 7-Eleven. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is George Trejo. Um, I think that it's good for the 7-Eleven um, to be open because it's more convenient for us to get medicine, food, good food, and I think it's a good idea. You know, um, you know, I think it's a good idea. Really, it does. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. All right. My name is Jeffrey Hambrick, 3936 Sutro Avenue. And basically, I think the 7-Eleven thing is an incredible idea for the simple fact that in cases of emergency, you have maybe pregnant women who have children that need 
maybe things in the middle of the night or yogurt or whatever, we are, we're totally losing the whole concept of it's not just a liquor store, it is a market. And that's what you're forgetting. So, I think a 7-Eleven would be incredibly wonderful. That's it. Okay, thank you. All right. We're, we're almost there, folks. Sharon Lewis, A.P. Williams, Mary Jones Dykes, and Atuan Bimbo. Sharon Lewis, A.P. Williams, Mary Jones Dykes, and Antoine Bimbo. Please, ma'am. Please show some courtesy to the speaker, please. Yes. I'm Sharon Lewis, and I stay at 4074 Lamarck Boulevard. I think it's nice to have a 7-Eleven dinner liquor store because 7-Eleven sells fruits, you know, fruits, uh, slushes, and hot dogs. And, and he said it cut down 90% food and 10% liquor. That's, that sounds nice. You know, really do. I really, I'm for 7-Eleven. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yes, I'm A.P. Williams, and I'm in favor of the 7-Eleven. other words, the way gas is now, I don't want to have to get up out of my bed and go up on Pico somewhere and look for a 7-Eleven. I want to be able to walk right out of my door, walk right up the street and find one. Thank you. Thank you. 40. 4185 and a quarter Lamert Boulevard. Okay. Trying to hear. Please. Good evening. My name is Mary Jones Darks, and I'm here representing the West Area Neighborhood Council. We held a meeting with King's Liquors and some residents from the community. And we're here today. We submitted a letter to support the community and the conditions as they stand. Also, I live in a community called Bowen Village, less than a mile away from where they're uh, um, up and down about a 7-Eleven. We have a 7-Eleven that don't even sell liquor. The hours are extended, and it's terrible. None of the things that they promised us, they have kept. So everybody here who think you're getting such a great big bargain because they put the name 7-Eleven on it, don't be surprised as to what will happen if it's a 7-Eleven and they're also selling alcohol. It's not what it's cracked up to be. I live in the community. I don't even go to the 7-Eleven at King and Coliseum. Thank you. Please, please. All right. Yeah, my name is Antoine Bimbo. I'm, I'm sorry. Can we hear the speaker, please? Yeah, my name is Antoine Bimbo. I stay on 4212 and a half Dagnan Boulevard. And um, I agree with it. A 7-Eleven is good for the neighborhood. Because actually, before the, they, um, these people owned the store, the store used to be, like, hectic. You know what I'm saying? Like, people wouldn't even want to go to the store. So now it's, like, it's, it's cool to go to the store. And a 7-Eleven would be good. We can go get our Slurpees. We won't have to go all the way across the neighborhood to get Slurpees. You know, it's the summertime. So I agree with it. Thank you. All right. That concludes the public hearing. Um, but I'd like to ask Mr. Roberts, David Roberts, from the council office to come forward and uh, give us his uh, position on this issue. Yeah, David Roberts, Economic Development Deputy for Council Member Parks. I believe all the committee members have a copy of the uh, January 29th letter. Uh, that was sent by Councilmember Parks to the zoning administrator. The councilman, in essence, stands by that letter. And, and, and just for the benefit of some of the community members who weren't at that hearing, uh, the councilman acknowledges that there have been long-standing uh, problems at that, loco lo that uh, location of uh, Seven Kings uh, Liquor. Uh, on the other hand, we have seen uh, improvement at the property since the new owner has, uh, has taken over control of the property. Um, further, uh, the councilman believes that, you know, 7-Eleven coming in to the community would be a positive thing. That being said, that being said, the, the problems and historical problems that liquor stores and the selling of alcohol have in the community, the councilman fervently believes that there should be a um, framework from which all 
operators, whether it's a grocery store, liquor store, 7-Eleven, whatever, should operate within. And in that January 29th letter, he included those, uh, those uh, recommendations. The zoning administrator in her decision, in essence, complied with what the councilman had asked for. So we are in concurrence with the zoning administrator and her determination. There's just a couple of small changes, and I'll actually perhaps just uh, identify them item by item according to the applicant's uh, challenge. The hours of operation from 5 to 12 midnight, the only change there and the only recommendation that the councilman uh, had was that it go from 7 a.m. to 1 a.m. So there's just a difference of one hour. We do not believe it should be open for 24 hours. Uh, number 10, state licensed security guard. We concur with that recommendation. Uh, uh, so an independent security guard. Correct, yes. Okay. Uh, number 21, um, we uh, agree again with the zoning administrator's original determination. Uh, item number 22, again, the councilman uh, concurs with the zoning administrator's original uh, determination. And finally, uh, as it relates to uh, uh, item 23, the councilman again concurs with the city, uh, the city zoning administrator's original interpretation. Uh, excuse me, it, it, it original um, uh, condition. Um, as it relates to um, perhaps the 7-Eleven coming in, we'd love, again, for them to come in, but again, they should work under these frameworks and prove that they can operate responsibly in the community. If there is a need from corporate 7-Eleven uh, to operate 24 hours, we would recommend that uh, the zoning administrator get the, have the discretion to come back within 12 months to review operations and to see if they are indeed being a good operator and complying with the other 23 uh, conditions and perhaps have some leniency to extend that. But at this point in time, the most we could uh, <coughs> uh, agree with was again 7 a.m. to 1 a.m., not 24 hours a day. And then I have uh, one uh, question for the city attorney's office. Typically, and you heard one of the uh, speakers indicate that the 7-Eleven on uh, Angeles Vista and Slauson um, only does not sell single sale cans or bottles. Um, in Councilman's Park's January 29th letter, and again, it's a standard uh, request that we make, we asked for no single sale cans of beer or wine. Again, typically, the single cans of beer, wine are the fortified wines, and that typically leads to the loitering activity we see around liquor stores in South Los Angeles. I just wanted to get some advice from the, the city attorney's office, if that's okay, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Jerry Birch, city attorney's office. Uh, the city lost a lawsuit many years ago when we attempted to impose that condition because uh, we are preempted under state law from imposing that condition. So as a result, we have advised not to impose that condition. Is there another, is there another way to accomplish that goal? Is there another way to accomplish that goal, Ms. Birch? The zoning administrator might be able to speak to that better, but we have certainly uh, allowed conditions and can lawfully impose conditions related to loitering and related to the other kinds of land use impacts that Mr. Roberts is discussing. What we cannot do is regulate the sale of alcohol. And the single cans condition was found by the court to regulate the sale of alcohol. Is, is it possible that if the applicant, I've seen in the applicant in some cases, they volunteer that as a condition? Again, for the record, Jerry Burge, not a fan of volunteered conditions because uh, the city cannot Reforce. enforce them. They are not legally imposed. Obviously, an operator can operate the, the best way possible. And, and if you believe that the operator uh, is promise is, is good, you can certainly accept that promise. But there is no way for the city to, to enforce legally it. enforce that promise. Okay. Okay. So I just want to make sure that we're all here in the same thing. Councilor Weiss, did you have something to say? Um, appreciate that. Mr. Roberts and I, um, and I appreciate that Councilman Parks is, is concerned about um, the, the, the impacts of the location. I guess I would just ask you and the zoning administrator um, if you could both stand there together. I, um, it's not important to me whose paragraph we refer to. I just want to know precisely where CD8 and the zoning administrator diverge. What are the, is there only that one difference in that one hour, midnight versus 1 a.m., or are there other differences? Okay. I'm Nick uh, The difference in hours, one hour, I've said midnight, and the council office uh, recommends 1 a.m. 
Uh, also, on the uh, alcohol sale, there were the single cans uh, request and alcohol-related uh, conditions that were recommended, which I did not impose uh, upon long-standing. I mean, I think the CIA attorney just made That's clear what we had. And uh, the uh, council office also recommended an approval of plans uh, with a date certain of one year. And uh, considering, as I said earlier in my presentation, considering the efforts that the uh, current operator had uh, uh, brought and improvements to the community, I wanted to encourage uh, further efforts by just making that plan approval review mandated only if there were problems linked, further uh, future problems linked to the site. So that is usually a good, the, the way it works is a good incentive for the operator to operate in a responsible manner and at the same time it maintains leverage to the community to complain and say, you know, we have violations of the conditions, you come back here, rather than putting a one-year burden on an operator who is operating responsibly. We have a question, Councilman. No, I'm just, I'm, I guess my question is what I get out of both Ms. Chavon and Mr. Roberts is a desire to hold the operator's feet to the fire. You both, you both are saying, since we want to hold the operator's feet to the fire, we propose X. Now, just hearing both of you describe it, I understand the one-year mandatory review more readily than I understand your approach, but maybe, I, maybe I'm missing something. Well, well, okay, I, I, well, think, I think the difference really is, um, is, it really is the one hour plus the added condition of no single can or bottle sales, um, and plus you're asking for a 12-month report on the status of this facility? Actually, a requirement they would have to come back for a review of plans, so the uh, zoning administrator could review the mitigations okay. that they've um, determined, and then I think it would also give the flexibility with the, the 7-Eleven concern. But, but, but that would be the pivotal point Correct. to describe or define the opportunity for 7-Eleven. To extend hours. If the conditions are improved and they are indeed keeping with the spirit of your intent. And we want to make sure that they renovate. <laughs> we make sure they do an improvement in lighting and all those things but, to the I guess what, I, what I don't understand is, Ms. Sharon, why do you not believe that a mandatory one-year review period would encourage uh, compliance. I, maybe I just didn't, I, I think I literally just didn't understand what you were saying. Okay, uh, Annick Charon for the record. Uh, the reason why I did not put a one year date certain is because this operator, I mean the witnesses, and you have heard that uh, yourself today, this operator has brought significant improvements to the site and is doing his best to operate the site in a responsible manner in spite of a, of a really heavy history. So in order to encourage the operator to keep a responsible management, I am making that review mandatory only if there are problems associated in the future with the operation of the site. If the site continues to operate without any problems, as it has been over the last only few months after uh, the, um, the instigation of the investigation by the planning department, if the site is operated in a responsible manner, then the applicant won't have the burden to come up for review unless, for example, let's say that you approve a, a, a 1 a.m. I, I guess I just, I, I appreciate that, and I just, I mean, it's not clear to me what would trigger the review and I, 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 I tend to like the council districts. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, Mr. Chair, my, my thoughts, but I, I defer to you since Please. you've done this more yeah. than I have. I mean, I, I, I sort of see, I, I'd like to take one of each of your recommendations and, and put them together. I'd like to see the one-year review that CD8 is recommending, but I'd also like to see the midnight closing and then give the operator the chance. Um, come on. Give the operator the chance over that year to demonstrate why it should get longer hours and, and, and then l allow that decision to be made. Um, because I'm just not, I'm not sure what good in the world happens between midnight and 1 a.m. And, and the council office is fine. It's fine with that recommendation. Fine with that. Okay, folks, so let's, um, 
Let's move in this direction. We'll grant in part and deny in part the appeal filed by Mahuda Shudri on behalf of Dallas Market Incorporated, DBA, Seven Kings Liquor, routes of the decisions only administered to impose corrective conditions based on what's been expressed by the council office and the zoning administrator uh, given the conditions that have been articulated before us. Jerry Birch, City Attorney's Office. For the record, I think you're granting the appeal as to the review of conditions because you're imposing the one year and you're denying the appeal as to all other conditions. Okay. And I do not believe, but correct me if I'm wrong, that you're modifying any other conditions. No. Okay. I, I'm sorry, Council Member, just to make certain, I understand, well, first I want to go back to the uh, condition number seven as proposed by the Council Office. I think number seven is a prohibition about the cups and the single containers. That was never clear as to whether we're going we're gonna to leave that one out. Are we adopting the conditions as proposed by the Council Office? I, 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 didn't, hear, I didn't hear discussion the, uh, between the ZA and the Council Office about Council Office Condition 7. I didn't, I asked for where were their divergences and, and that wasn't brought up. Okay, as far as those conditions, again, as the city attorney, Annick Charon, uh, indicated, I mean, those are all call related and by state law, we cannot, I mean, the, this uh, body cannot uh, impose single, the city. Ms. Burge, is that, is that correct? The, the, the cups and ice? For the record, Jerry Burge, that, that's Is there one, a cup and ice case? That's one I no. There is, and I believe we could um, we could defend that uh, because it is not necessarily the the sale of alcohol, but but mo but but the zoning administrator would have to articulate a reason for the condition that's not based on the sale of alcohol. Well, well, she'll, well, well let's ask them to prepare findings before we get to council, and I think the council district date recommends this. It's worth it's worth doing. I just want to make sure we are not going to provide. We're not going to allow no single can or bottle sales. Correct. Okay, if I'm, I'm, excuse me, I'm sorry, Jerry Bridge, when you say you're not going to allow, you mean you're not going to impose that condition or you are going to impose that condition? My understanding is that we want to prevent the sale of single cans and bottle sales. Well, we I'd would like recommend to, that you not impose that condition based on prior All the court cases. stuff, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so to clarify for our clerk then, I think Mr. Reyes and I and CD8 would like to impose CD8 proposed condition number six, but we've been informed by council that we cannot, so we won't. But as to their proposed, as to CD8's proposed condition number seven relating to cups and ice, um, Mr. Reyes and I are in agreement with, with that. Yes. Um, and as to what Ms. Bird said a few moments ago, that uh, the appeal is granted in part so that we can impose the additional request by CD8 for the one year review period and it's denied in all other respects. Right. Is that okay? Thank, thank you both for an excellent thank presentation. You. Thank, you. thank you. All right, folks. So that concludes item number six. Well, thank you for participating. You can please exit quietly so we can proceed with our next item. Okay, Roberto, let's start with number seven. Uh, actually, item five, council. Item five, I'm sorry. It's, seven already took care of. It's an appeal by. Uh, why don't you hold on, Roberto? That, that may be. Your boring voice can. Uh, <laughs> uh, can you just hold on, please? And uh, why don't you just speak into the mic, Roberto, and keep going. Um, item five, councilman, is an appeal filed by Michelle Mendelson. They're appealing the decision of the West LA APC. Uh, and their action to approve a track map for a new maximum four-unit residential condo in CD5. 
and the planner is present. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Richard Gervais for the Planning Department. Uh, this is a second level appeal on a four unit condominium approved by the advisory agency. Mm -hmm. that, that approval was, uh, was done because they met every criteria that was required and, and we approved it. It was a second go around on that site. It's a four unit condominium on a major highway just east of Century City across the street from a 300 unit apartment building. The previous appeal focused on traffic uh, overflow parking from nearby commercial, so on and so forth. And the conclusion of my report to the APC at that point in time was not one of those items would be addressed by the approval of the appeal, which would only mean they're going to tear down a triplex and uh, build a four unit condominium. So one additional dwelling unit. The second appeal that has been filed to City Council on, this, on, on the APC's decision to deny the prior appeal has now added the wrinkle of the lot area does not meet the square footage necessary. The original application for the RD2 zone for four units required 8,000 square feet. They had 7,904. That was because the Bureau of Engineering had asked for a dedication. That dedication was changed from a dedication to an easement, so the easement area is no longer deducted from the lot area, there is over 8,100 square feet that will be shown on the final four unit parcel map. The staff recommends denial of the appeal. There's just no basis. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any questions from the staff? All right. Just hold on tight. I believe Mr. Mendelson is the appellant on this case. Mr. Mendelson, Jerry, I believe, and Mendelson, please come up forward. Here's your name and address. Yeah, Jerry Mendelson, 1311 Beverly Green Drive. I'm the uh, third house on, uh, north of the 1333 project. Uh, at the final um, appeal that we went to before the uh, city council, I mean the, the planning commission, excuse me, uh, two of the members were not there. And it seemed to be that they had already decided uh, that this uh, project was going to go through. I had made a CD. Uh, our street is impacted by the mid-rise building, 1991, which is about 14 stories, has about 85 businesses in it. There are about three to 4,000 cars that go in it. There's a 24-hour fitness gym. Um, they didn't look at this. All of them acknowledged to me that they did not look at the CD. One of them said that he had been there for about 30 minutes to look at it. He says, we know about all the environmental pro problems. We know about everything. They acknowledged it and they said, we don't care. It's not our problem. It's not Mr. Sabit's problem. He says, it's your problem. Now, everything west, uh, on the west side of Beverly Green Drive, from Pico to Hill Green, are all single family residents. There are no triplexes. There are no duplexes. They're all single family residences. I know about the zoning, and there is a thing that will be discussed about that later. And the thing is, is that the preservation of a west side of an area, the reference that was made by one of the councilmen or one of the attorneys representing the other party was saying, well, there's a 350-story apartment building. Well, that's six high, that's, that's six lane highway across. What reference and relevance does it have to a continuity of a street that is all single family dwellings? It, 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 it behooves me to think that a planning commission can be aware of every environmental condition and the fact that they didn't cite them and know that we have traffic, we have speeders, we have problems, 20, we have loitering, that they know about it and acknowledge it. It's like a police officer saying, I know there's a criminal down there, but I'm not going to go after him because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to risk my life for it. We live in a neighborhood that should be preserved. And what's going to happen with the density of four? And we have an outsider who's coming into a neighborhood. Time's up. No, no, please finish. Oh. Um, for your record, if you want to look at it, I'm appalled that a planning commission of LA I, would not look I, at the. Uh, would I just look, I, pardon, I want to interrupt you because I want to I want to help you. Um, don't focus on that. Just tell us the precise reason, the actual reason that you think your side should prevail. I don't care whether someone looked at something. I'm, I'm sorry. The last part was. What's the precise reason why your side should prevail? Why 1333 should not be built? Why you should win this argument. What's the reason? 
The reason is because if every member like those who felt so passionate about the 7-Eleven were here in my neighborhood, they would vote against this project because we are impacted by this huge high-rise building that we can't remove. We have 24 hours. On the weekends, I cannot park. I park 20 cars away from my house to walk to my house because there's cars all over. And these pictures, which, you know, pictures sometimes will tell nothing or they'll tell a thousand words. The corner, the intersection of Beverly Green and, and, and Pico, and we didn't have, have one testimony from Traffic Patrol, LAPD, which has done a great job, but they just don't have a time. They can make a career, and I've called them out, and when they come out, they write tickets all day long. The Traffic Patrol officers who write tickets for people because we have restricted parking from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day. We have handicaps going up and down. That's a sensitive issue. I'll leave that alone. But the point is, is that we can't afford. Our street will not facilitate parking. He's providing 10 parking spaces. Where will his guests, where will his service people? We have people sitting. My kids are afraid to come home after school every day because people are sitting and loitering in their cars, on their phones, asleep, doing miscellaneous things. We have the preservation on at least one side of a beautiful part of West LA that are all single family homes. And to do anything other than tear it down and build a new home or remodel it, would keep the integrity. The other, the major thing is the zoning is, is that my setback when I just finished my house was 27 and a half. It had to be prevailing setback, which the city required. If Mr. Savit builds his four unit, he will be 15 feet from the sidewalk. He will go vertically 50 feet up in the air. The intersection and the police testimony, there is a neighbor who noted a fatality that happened at the corner at the intersection of Beverly Green and Pico. The police officers, the LAPD traffic patrol, this should be frozen for a year to get all the professionals of our departments, traffic, police, records, accidents, crimes, loitering, before we go ahead for this. I think that 7-Eleven person who said we should freeze it for a year and do an, an, an extensive review and analysis. We're not talking about a neighborhood that doesn't have this. This monstrous building is an impediment and the traffic and everything else. Thank and you. if I, I just wish my neighbors could be here, but many of them are elderly, they don't understand English, they're foreigners, they don't understand the process of our government. And if they, and in that 500 radius map, all of them should be able to vote on whether or not this project should go ahead or not. Thank and you, I Mr. believe that variances and modifications, and if there's this discrepancy which has been brought up about easement or dedication, which is a gray area, because that 8,000 threshold, one of the uh, uh, commissioners told me, well, we don't care if it's under 80. He says, we would let that go in a minute. Uh, L.A. needs more, more, uh, more housing. These are condos that are 2 million, 3 million condos. Thank you, Mr. Minister. So. Thank you, sir. That's what I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We have... Two of the cards on this item, Emmanuel Sabe or Sabet and Marie France Salon. Yes, okay. uh, so Emmanuel Sabet, come on, come on up. Good afternoon. My name is Emmanuel Sabet. Uh, my address is 324 South Elm Drive, Beverly Hills. I'm a part owner of the property at 1333 Beverly Drive. Beverly Green Drive. Uh, we have, uh, uh, when we designed this um, project, we made sure that we are not asking for any concession and we have uh, uh, obeyed all the codes and all the rules and this has been uh, seen by uh, planning commission, by uh, by area, uh, West, uh, West Los Angeles Area Commission, and they have, uh, you know, they've all approved the project. And, uh, you know, I uh, recommend that we continue with the project. I really appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our next speaker, Marie France Long. Are you here? Yes.
Good afternoon, honorable member of the Los Angeles City Council and all of you. My Good name afternoon. is Marie-France Salin, and I live I live at my location since 1974. I, in fact, watch the 99-11 being built. The neighborhood has changed tremendously. This intersection has been the subject of many, many accidents and one death. Now, we are not opposed to a project we are opposed of the traffic and the danger. It is right at the corner. And if the Los Angeles Code say that three units are allowed, why are we permitting four units without us knowing about it? Four units are going to give us more traffic, more danger, losing our children, we're all very afraid of that. My children have grown up now. But all my, uh, there is many neighbors who came with young children. And we already have spoken about the danger of this intersection many times. We had over 200 signatures asking you to protect this location for the 99-11 tenant, their client, as the neighbors. I have been here for almost 35 years and I beg you to protect my new children on my block, my old neighbors who walk, all those little dogs. We are counting on you to protect us to the best of the, what the codes say. And I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. And we Thanks. didn't know there was an easement. We were not told. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councilman Weiss. Um, Mr. Reyes, I, I'd suggest that we close the public hearing on the item. Okay, yeah, that's all the speakers I've been spoken to. Okay. Um, have Mr. Mendelson and the zoning administrator come forward, please? Mr. Mendelson? Yes, Mr. Mendelson. Because you're the appellant here. Right. I no just. Wife's supposed to be here, but I'm here. Okay. I just, I really, I just want to understand the argument here. My understanding is that there are three units currently on the subject property? No, single family resident. Okay. It's, it's zoned RD2. It's zoned for three units. Zone. Is that correct? Uh, it, it has a capacity of... Oh, you got to speak. You both have to speak it, in the microphone. Richard Gervais for the tape. It has The lot is zoned RD2. It's 8,000 plus square feet. It's allowed to have four dwelling units maximum on the site. Right now there's an old existing single family home. This again is on Pico Boulevard. Okay. So it's down zone from R four at one point in time. It's so D two. Four units are permitted under the zoning. Do both of you agree with that? No, because there's a discrepancy. You, gotta, you have both have footage. to speak into the microphone. So just Sorry. answer me but speak in the mic. You why don't you agree with that? Because we have looked at the data of the surveys and with the dedication and the easement because we don't know the manipulation of language that is being used on behalf of the Planning Commission. We have calculated with many people, I think Marie Franz is better because she has more expertise on that, there is a discrepancy that it does fall below the 8,000 and that threshold prohibits Mr. Sabet from building four units. Okay, under your calculation, if your calculation were correct, how many units would he be permitted to build? Three. Three? Three. Yes. So, I, I'm first I want to ask the Planning Department if they agree with the calculations of the appellants. The lot area, if the easement had been taken as a dedication, the net end lot area would have been 7,904 square feet, 96 square feet short of the 8,000. Because the dedicate and the map was prepared that way by the civil engineer, because the Bureau of Engineering asked for an easement, the dedicated two feet along Pico running the entire length of the lot is not subtracted from the lot area. So the net lot area at when the map is recorded will be about eighty one hundred plus square feet, well over the eight thousand. It's just the map was prepared assuming the Bureau of Engineering wanted a dedication. The Bureau of Engineering said we only want an easement 
not the dedication. Dedication takes the dirt and becomes the city's property, and easement just simply says, I won't build over it, and you can use it I will by given, the city. Given that, my question for you and for the city attorney is, is there a discretionary act that, Ms. Burge, is there a discretionary act that has been appealed here? Am I supposed to make a determination here as to whose calculation is correct? Is that part of what I'm doing here? What's Jer legally before us? <laughs> Jerry Burge, City Attorney's Office, for the record. Uh, what's legally before you is an appeal on the tract map, and that's actually what we call a de novo review. So the actual entire tract map is before you. Having said that, however, every tract map has the same language in it, which says the LAMC may not permit this maximum approved density. That is a calculation for building and safety to verify at the time of uh, the final map and the time of permit. So uh, the city planning department has recommended for, they're recommending it on their best knowledge, and uh, that is what is before you. It will be ultimately a uh, building and safety's call. Uh, one final comment from staff. What has gotten lost in the shuffle here, all the neighborhood issues you've heard about and the APC heard about are generated by the high intense commercial existing development on PICO, not the proposed four no, unit I, I understand. I understand that. I just, let me ask the appellants, you, your case revolves around your assertion that your calculation gets you to 7,900. Is that correct? Yes. You got to speak in the mic. I mean, just, I, please just speak in the microphone. Yes. It's okay. So, you would concede that if you're wrong about that calculation, the other side gets to build the four units. Is that fair? If you're making reference to the uh, building department making that judgment call, as you said, to attorney, without asking any of the neighbors their consent, because I know on variances and easements, I've had to get consent okay. from neighbors in order to do things. Here's, okay, here's what I'd like to ask you all to do while we hear the next matter. I'd like to ask the planning department to sit down with you once again, and my staff, Ms. Kenworthy, will sit with you in the back and look again at these calculations. And, and, and I know you've done this before. I just want to have it done again so that there can be a record that, they've, that it's been that these tires have been kicked thoroughly and we can decide whether there's a reason to, to go with your calculations or if, if planning department is solid. So I'd like to ask you guys to look at it together once again, if we could continue that for a few moments while we okay. do the other matters. So, so we'll table this. Thank you. We'll move to the next item. And when that's completed, then we'll come back to this item. So what is next, Roberto? Um, the next item, Councilman's item 8A and 8B. Oh, the real fun ones. <laughs> 8B is the track map for the project, 8A, which is being appealed. And 8A is also being appealed as to the height variance and the zone change, uh, site plan review, and all other entitlements. And the appeal was filed by the Melrose Camifer Avenue LLC and Douglas Haynes on behalf of the La Mirada Neighborhood Association. And the planning department staff is present. Okay. Good afternoon, council members. Madhu Kumar, planning department. Since there were so many actions the planning commission took on this case, uh, what I'm going to do is first let you know what the actions were, and the applicant can tell you which ones are being appealed. Now, the request was for a uh, RAS 4 zone on the lots and what I've done is I brought you a community plan that w you can see the two properties in hatch marks we're talking now about the four lots in the commercial portion where the zone change was requested from C4 to RAS 4 uh, the commission approved RAS 3 uh, on this there's also a request for a height district change because this, the commercial lots are restricted to one to one far. So th by giving them the RAS 3, they still got 3 to 1. Now, the next request was for a zone variance to allow density, uh, uh, transfer density and averaging over the two 
lots. Okay, now let me explain to you here. The front four are in commercial. The four across an alley are in residential. So what we have here is two different plan designations. One is neighborhood commercial, the other one is medium residential. Different heights. The residential portion is in R31XL. That's 30 feet and two stories. The request was to have 96 units straddle an alley, go across for a height of almost 62 feet high. What the commission approved on the residential portion was a height of 45 feet. The same height which was approved on the Melrose parcels, the parcels fronting on Melrose, 45. So that we can have a balanced development but the, it was denied to go across the alley since they're both different zones, different fires, different heights, and just there was, both the projects can be developed at the density of one, square, uh, one unit per 800 square feet because the RAS3 and the R3 allow that. So this variance was denied for the density averaging. Moving on. The variance to calculate residential density on the RA, on the Melrose Zone portion, to include the area for a 15 foot street dedication to be uh, included for calculation of density, the commission denied that. Now we come to the height. The applicant had requested a building height of almost 62 feet in lieu of the maximum height of 30 feet for the R31XL zone portion. As I mentioned earlier, the commission approved a height of 45 feet. And, I, you know, all the properties, if you look at this uh, plan map, everything around there is 1XL. So this would be a variance, the first variance allowing an additional 15 feet so that we could have some a reasonable project here allow the more housing to be built there which three stories and the additional 15 feet would allow so it was a reasonable compromise by the commission now we also had requests for adjustments the applicant had requested that the R31XL zone portion of the project fronting Camelford Avenue, which is a residential, to observe a reduced front yard of 10 feet instead of the required 15 feet. The commission denied that. However, they did approve a reduced rear yard of zero feet in lieu of the required 15, because that abuts the alley. The commission also approved the Melrose portion to observe a reduced front yard of zero feet in lieu of five feet, which is the required setback for an RAS zone, and also allowed a reduced rear yard of zero feet in lieu of the required minimum five because it abuts an alley. Since the site plan which was submitted at the time of the request uh, was for a RAS4 zone and what was approved for RAS3, the site plan approval was denied without prejudice. What I'm going to do is uh, this concludes my initial presentation and if you wish I'll come back and explain uh, the reasons for the disapprovals or the approvals. Okay, thank you. All righty. Let's hear from the appellants. Oh, the GAT 8B. Yes. <laughs> Please. Uh, Sarah Molina, Department of City Planning. Uh, this is the second level approval for vesting tentative track 66997. On November 19, 2007, the Deputy Advisory Agency 
approved uh, VTT 66997 for the construction of 96 residential condominiums and 3,350 square feet of commercial space with 216 parking spaces, um, including an alley vacation. The approval was contingent upon the approval of case number CPC 2006 6519 ZC ZV HD ZAA SPR. That approval was appealed by four separate parties. On December 13th, the City Planning Commission uh, denied the appeal in part. Um, this is because they approved the RAS. Three instead of the RAS 4 and also denied um, some of the variances that were requested. So this reduced the number of residential units to 62. Uh, the uh, commercial uh, square footage was um, remained at 3,350 square feet. The parking spaces were reduced to um, a required 139 parking spaces and the alley vacation was denied. Um, this appeal uh, was filed on February 19th by the applicant's representative. Okay, thank you much. All right, so let's hear from the applicants, the representatives of the applicants. Um, Chairperson Reyes, uh, how much time do we have? Um, why don't you do your best to give us the picture of why the appeal is before us? And um, uh, if it, uh, Chairperson Reyes, uh, Councilmember Weiss, I would like to kind of describe the situation, the exact appeals. I will ask my colleague, uh, Michael Gonzalez, to come up and walk you through the appeals themselves, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, this project uh, started over two years ago and for some time we have been working with the community to find a project that would best match uh, the area that is being developed and then a community plan that is being proposed. Through, those, through that time we have worked diligently uh, to find a compromise uh, that would reach uh, the level of development that one is necessary for the project to move forward but more importantly that matches with the area in terms of how development is being viewed from here going forward. Currently the uh, community plan update for Hollywood views the Camaford site as an R4 site. Now that isn't passed yet but in terms of where the planning department seem to be headed. Um, in terms of the Melrose side um, we believe that it is a transit-oriented street, which has uh, not been uh, contested by anybody, and as such, was deserving of some additional density than was currently historically planned on an FAR, which allowed only a one-to-one -one ratio. So from that perspective, we designed a project which I would like to walk you through briefly and tell you where we've ended up with the community, uh, at least with the neighborhood council, who we have gotten support from the applicable neighborhood council. The project uh, sits as the. As well, you just said something really fast. And I'm like, sorry. The we have the support of the applicable neighborhood council. We sit at the southwestmost corner of the Studio District Neighborhood Council. And there's a council, there, there's a neighborhood council boundary on the other side of Melrose from us and on the other side of Vine from uh, Vine or El Centro from us. So you got support from the closest neighborhood council? Can that be said? What? The one we sit in, we have the support of. Okay. The neighborhood council that the project is cited in, we have the support of. All right. So, uh, and you have a letter to that effect. There is a alleyway that exists between the two properties, as was described by staff, that is a substandard 10-foot alleyway. What we believed we could do was build over the top of that alleyway to provide greater opportunity for density. After speaking with the fire department, the police department, and public works, no one utilized that alleyway. But what we believed we could do would be to improve that alleyway to 20 feet, have it retained in the city control, and, uh, and vacate the part above, uh, above the alley, the airspace above it, and build across it, which is what is being proposed. By doing so, we have created a project that ha does a number of things. One, in terms of where we're at as has as, as been approved by the neighborhood council which we are sit cited in. We have provided where the planning commission set us at a 45 foot height limit from 
Camaford all the way to Melrose, which meant we could build at the Camaford side 15, with, after a 15 foot setback, 45 feet up. What we chose to do and what the neighborhood council requested we do is on the Camaford side, reduce that height to 30 feet for part of the property and move the density to the center of the site where it wouldn't be seen and move up to 50 feet into the center of the property. So by maintaining the area over the alleyway, we move height, so we've reduced to 29 feet on the Camaford side for 62 feet from the curb or 47 feet from the property line. At 47 feet from the property line, we move up from 29 feet to 50 feet. We then carry 50 feet over to the Melrose side with a slight dip down to 45 feet at the Melrose side okay. on the Melrose frontage, which ma matches the development of the site directly across the street, which has been developed at 45 feet. We also provided, the neighborhood had a, a desire and the neighborhood council had a desire to ensure that there was the ability to have a new lane dedicated for a uh, right-hand turn and also maintain a 15-foot sidewalk. Um, what we have done is we have given the dedication necessary for that lane plus a 10-foot sidewalk and we've given a 5-foot easement so that we could create a 15-foot sidewalk on the Melrose side which was requested by the, uh, by the neighborhood council. We have also maintained the 15-foot sidewalk on the Camaford side so that the neighborhood council, which they also wanted, was to get a 15-foot sidewalk on the Camerford side. So we have 15-foot sidewalks entirely around the site. Um, additionally, we have improved the alleyway to take all loading off the street and put it into the back on the alleyway since we now have a 20-foot alleyway. So that move in, move out is allowed from the alleyway and there's no more parking necessary for loading on the public streets. Uh, Finally, in terms of the density, that was the area that was most contested at the end of the day, was how dense it was. Because what we've done is we've really only moved five feet above the Planning Commission's recommendation, and that's only in the center of the site to where it's not really visible. So the only thing that became truly contested was the density. In the density issue, what was concerning of the neighborhood was that they did not want to set a precedence of an RAS4 zoning to be applied to the property. Now, we had requested an RAS4 zoning so that we had to appeal that request. What we've agreed with the neighborhood and what they agreed to in the neighborhood council meeting was that they would reduce, we would, we would accept an RAS4 designation, but we would seek a variance from the standard in terms of the number of units per lot foot. So what we've asked for is we actually, the density splits the difference between RAS 4 on Melrose and RAS 3 on Melrose and splits the difference between R3 on Camaford and R4 on Camaford. If the neighborhood community plan update passes in its current configuration, we will actually be less dense on Camaford than the community plan would allow and we would be more dense on Melrose than the community plan seems to indicate that it would allow. But even though you do that, you would still be consistent with the height across the street? Correct. Okay. We are 45 feet matching the height across the street. Okay. Um, in terms of, of how we view this site, again, we are trying as best we can to create parity and a project that works and where we talked about, people talk about density averaging and, and the like, what we've really tried to do in doing the variance process is not to mix and match the densities, but rather approve an RAS3 on one side with a variance and an RAS and an R3 on the other side with a variance, thereby not really averaging the densities, but putting appropriate densities on each side to allow for the 85 units to be developed. The Planning Commission requ uh, allowed us to have 62 units. We had requested 96. We met in the middle with the neighborhood at 85 units is what we are proposing today. Okay. Um, we have also uh, are providing $800,000 to Hollywood Community Housing for the development of 48 affordable housing units. Uh, they are here today to testify uh, that but for this investment, uh, they would not be able to build those 48 units. Additionally, in doing that, there's been some talk about tearing down bungalows and things and that sort of thing. The reality is, 
is that neighbor Hollywood Community Housing is endeavoring to preserve 42 historic bungalow units and revamp them. They are relocating some of the residents of those facilities off-site and giving them priority to come back on-site after, after they are finished developing them. And they are doing it on an ASGA, on a, on a rolling basis, so they're trying to disturb the least number of people possible. Uh, in terms of the bungalows that once existed on this site, which you may also hear about, um, we had a demolition permit to demolish those bungalows, but held off on doing so, and actually went to the, uh, the city's historic, um, uh, historic Resources Commission, and they made the determination that they were not historic, and only after that did we demolish the bungalows that existed on the site that we, that we are proposed, proposing this project on. We believe this is the appropriate project for the site, and we're here to answer any questions you have. Okay. And my assumptions are that you've been working hand in hand with the council office as you've been going through these processes. Uh, I, m more so within that. We, the council office has asked us to continually go back to the neighborhood and to work with the neighborhood council, and it was only unt until being set back, back, and back until we reached the agreement with the neighborhood council on the proposed project did we gain the support of the council office and I believe they are here today to talk okay. about that as well. Okay, only because I'm going to be losing quorum, I still got two more items to go. I need to get through these items as, as um, efficiently as possible. So I'm gonna cut down the public hearing to one minute instead of two. Uh, council member, just before we go with the public hearing, I want to let you know we do have two community impact statements. One in support of the project uh, and one in opposition to the project. The one in support of the project is listed on the agenda as the Hollywood Studios District Neighborhood Council. And we also received today in opposition to the project uh, 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 a community impact statement from the Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council. From which one? The Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council. Mid Wilshire? The Greater Wilshire. Okay. All right, folks. So we've, we've heard. The staff report we've heard from the applicants, the appellants, and, and why they would like to see those projects. So let's try to get through these cards so we don't lose quorum, because I'd like to also attend to the other items on the agenda. So that being said, um, uh, Doug Haynes, we can keep it to one minute. I apologize, but it's only because I, I want to make sure we get to hear from as many people as possible. Doug Haynes, Scott Campbell, and then Lucille Saunders. One minute, please. Barbara, Hi. one minute. Barbara? Excuse me, but... One minute? Okay, sorry. I, I'd also like to point out that I'm an appellant in this case. Okay. And I should have an opportunity of more than one minute, okay. if I may. Go ahead. My name's Doug Haynes. I'm with the La Mirada Avenue Neighborhood Association. And we appealed two aspects of the City Planning Commission's decision on this. One is the uh, uh, XL. Uh, designation, the variance being uh, altered to 45 feet on Camford Avenue. The other is certification of the MND. And our appeal is based on two points. One, there is no hardship whatsoever in this case. I don't care how often and how many times Jerry over the past two years, Mr. Jerry Newman, has tried to spin this whole thing, but we've been involved with this for two years. There's no hardship. It's entirely self-imposed by design. And in fact, the applicant has admitted at public meetings that they need these variances for the profit, for the project to be profitable. Second, the MND, which was written by the developer and essentially rubber stamped by city staff, is utterly inadequate to fully and fairly disclose, as required by CEQA, the impacts of this project. I believe that city staff expressed appropriately that when it comes to the XL designation, that's what this entire area currently is. There's a 30-foot height limitation in this entire area. This street has nothing but one and two-story buildings currently. Also, to move it along with the MND, I became involved in this project originally when I found out that the residents of this site, there were originally 48 units, there's eight still standing. Um, we're being threatened, terrorized, being threatened with deportation by the applicant, and uh, basically run off the property. 130 people lost their homes. When he talks about $800,000 being put forward for affordable housing, well, we've lost already 40 units of affordable housing. The 800,000 will pay for less than two units of affordable housing. So that's a net loss of 38 units of affordable housing. 
again, over 130 people were run out of their property that had lived there for decades. As far as the M&D, the case of Orinda Association for Staconta, Costa County has established that you cannot demolish property before the CEQA process has begun. In this case, the MND wasn't uh, allowed for public review until February of 2007 after the bungalows were demolished. So the city has no right to certify this MND. And in fact, no right to approve this project whatsoever. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. Okay, Scott Campbell, Lucille Saunders. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Scott Campbell, 1322 North McCadden Place. I'm Vice President of Central Hollywood Neighborhood Council. We're across the side street uh, from this project, El Centro, and have Camerford from El Centro to Vine. Thank you. Uh, our board has voted to support the Melrose side at RAS3, to support 15-foot setback on Camerford, to support the 30-foot height limit on Camerford all the way back to the back of the property line to require the replacement of trees as required by the city, 63 trees, and to not allow building over the alley. Our concern is that the residential properties all along the back side of Melrose will be bought up and developed. And while we support transit-oriented development along our corridors, we also support preserving our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lucille Saunders. Then we'll have uh, Bill Harris, and then Charles Daughtry. Please. Thank you. The Melrose Neighborhood Association supports the Melrose Hill and the La Mirada Neighborhood Association's appellant positions on the, uh, against the proposed development. This uh, development super density and zoning averaging precedents would significantly um, impact our adjacent community. We've attempted to work with the developers and also with the council members, uh, members office as far as meeting for this project, seeing the design bef bef uh, and review any development before the meetings and this has not been forthcoming as Mr. Newman has testified. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Bill Harris and Maura Johnson of Hollywood Community Housing Corporation. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Um, we're here to speak on behalf of this project. We feel that 85 units is appropriate to be developed along this section of Melrose. No one disputes that Los Angeles is experiencing a housing crisis. What is in dispute is where do we put all the housing that needs to be built. I think this is an excellent location. The site is well located accepts the density, it's close to shopping, it's close to transportation, it's close to jobs. It is the true embodiment of smart growth and it is the future of Los Angeles being built today. I think if you look at the project that Watt Jenton has already built directly across the street, it's a beautiful development. I think that the developer will do a fine job on this site as well. Um, they've already removed an existing nuisance, the Martini Lounge, and we support this project, and we would ask you to move this project ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes. I may say very briefly, and Barbara, um, on item five, uh, staff, the applicants, the appellants met with my staff. The applicant has submitted a letter consenting to a continuance of the item until plumb next week and whatever else Council his deadlines were. Okay, so you've got that. Yes. And um, in the meantime, Mr. Chair, we're going to ask BOE to weigh in on that issue of the easement versus the dedication so we can get some clarity. Thank you. Sounds good. All right. That's Council, more. Council members, staff, uh, neighbors, I'm Charles Datra. I'm the president of the Larchmont Village Neighborhood Association. Uh, we are the neighborhood association uh, going up to Melrose direct, directly opposite this development. Uh, as I think someone else referred to earlier, this has been a two-year conversation. Uh, this is certainly not the worst developer to ever come down a pike. It's really a question of, is the city of Los Angeles required uh, to indemnify an economic equation that a developer's entered into that results in 
density that is too great for this site. We are not arguing that the site should not be redeveloped. We are in support of the Planning Commission's findings. Uh, we are in support and appreciate the concessions the developers made uh, to attempt to get to it. It is simply too dense and will overwhelm the Camerford, El Centro, Melrose area with real impacts on all the adjoining uh, areas. That's Thank it. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you much. Karen Gilman, Robert Wishard, and June Bilgor. Good afternoon. I'm going to speak right into the microphone because I have laryngitis. Okay. I'm Karen Gilman, 4941 Elmwood Avenue, LA 9004. I live in the Larchmont Village Neighborhood Association. We are one of the member neighborhood association stakeholders of the Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council, whose community impact statement is on record. It's called Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council. Two of the elected members at Neighborhood Council will speak to you today, and they will tell you what the boundaries are. As you heard from the developers, this property is at the convergence of three neighborhood councils. That corner is the convergence of three neighborhood councils across the street in two directions. It's, it's, it's additional neighborhood councils. Okay. And the other two prefer the City Planning Commission's decision. All right. Now, I have the Spanish language petition that was translated by mothers of disabled children, uh, Latino mothers who live up and down El Centro, who went up and down the little blocks discussing with their friends the project. And one of the mothers, Mrs. Irma Cruz, spoke with Mr. Ricardo Flores of your staff yesterday at great length in Spanish. Okay. Can you please submit that for the record and we'll read it? It's part of the packet that okay. Ms. Susan Thank Einstein you. will be submitting to Barbara Greaves and Patrice you, Lattimore. They collected more signatures you, than the neighbors we'll across Melrose. Speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Robert Richard and June Bilgar. I'm Rob Wishart from 403 North Bronson Avenue. Um, I represent Larchmont Village on the Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council. Um, as your staff just informed you, well, we adopted a resolution at our May 14th meeting um, strongly opposing the development as proposed right now and endorsing the um, Planning Commission proposal. The developers are just trying to bite off more than the neighborhood can chew right now. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, I'm June Bill Gore. I live at 355 South Windsor Boulevard. Myself, my neighbors, everyone I've spoken to feels that this, Im because we all use this corridor on Melrose and Larchmont, plus all of Larchmont has yet to be developed. It, this impacts tremendously the entire area and the density is way too great for the area, for, that, for Melrose, the street. We support, or I support, many of us do, the position taken by the City Planning Commission with respect to the proposed project. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara Hardesty, Susan Einstein, and Winifrey Mosa. My name is Barbara Hardesty. I live at 256 South Lucerne Boulevard. Lucerne runs right into where this project would be if it was to cross Melrose. Uh, I am against the uh, height limit uh, 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 being raised. Uh, I have lived in, on, on Lucerne for 39 years. I have seen how the traffic has worsened and uh, how difficult it is uh, even to find parking in that area. I volunteered in a thrift shop that was right next door to this project for five years for the Assistance League. I know what the situation is like with the parking, and I think this will just make it much worse. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next speakers? Susan Einstein and Winifrey Mosa. Good afternoon. My name is Susan Einstein. I live at 636 North Gower Street. Um, and I'm a past president of the uh, Larchmont Village Neighborhood Association. Uh, I just want to um, also state uh, something about the traffic. I have the packets um, that Karen Gilman was alluding to that have the petitions in them. But I also have some uh, images that show um, the profile of the neighborhood, the elevations of the neighborhood, and one image that shows, uh, one page that shows traffic on an ordinary Thursday afternoon at 2 o'clock. I didn't wait for the traffic to be all backed up. I just went out there and shot some pictures. It was backed up for four, four blocks in both directions. I just want to make note of the fact that um, Paramount Studios and 
two cemeteries are in this area, and so there's no cross streets through there. So this particular corner, even though it's a transit area, Melrose is considered transit area, this particular area has terrific traffic problems, and we're trying to hold that back. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Mosa? Uh, my name is Winifred Mosa. I live at 617 North Gower Street, zip code 9004. I belong to and I'm the treasurer of the Larchmont Village Neighborhood Association. <clears throat> and uh, I am against any zone changes, other, any more zone changes or variance changes that has been made on this property. And as far as the traffic goes, if you're going to throw into the street a building of, say, 90 or 150 people, we're going to have a traffic jam. And Melrose now is literally a parking lot anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Mosa. Edward Villarreal Hunt, William Gilman, Judy Dugan, and John H. Wellborn. You're welcome to come to the aisle if you like to, form a line. Edward Villarreal Hunt, William Gilman, Judy Dugan, and John H. Wellborn. I'm here representing the Melrose Hill Neighborhood Association. I live at 4928 West Melrose Hill. Uh, we have many concerns about the project. To begin with, it involves the destruction of 48 very low-income residences in a delightful 1919 bungalow village. I think our biggest concern is that this is basically about a, an $800,000 cash payment to kickstart two pet projects of our councilman and in return get him to support this project and to not uh, support the designation of the 1919 bungalows that were torn down. Uh, as far as the neighborhood council support of this, uh, I'm a board member of the Hollywood Studio District Neighborhood Council, and it's my understanding that it's on their agenda for their next meeting to be reconsidered. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have Gilman, Judy Dugan, and we'll have uh, John H. Wilder. Hello. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Bill Gilman, and I live at 5812 Camerford, which is three doors down from the proposed uh, project. I want to voice, voice my support for the project for Camerford Loss. The area is really in desperate need of redevelopment and new energy. I have no doubts that the neighborhood will retain its spirit and pride at the same time as smart transit and parking sensitive growth is created. We have entrenched gang and drug problems that many of the longtime residents have simply grown accustomed to. And while there's lots of interest in neighborhood watch and improving community standards, part of that is inviting new stakeholders into the area. Public transit changes come when the community demands them and higher density helps that process along. New building starts help create hope, particularly amongst resident owners and incentivizing more development should be a part of any community agenda. I fully support the project zoning and height proposals. The developers have already shown a commitment to the neighborhood by uh, buying and shutting down the Martini Lounge nightclub, an area nuisance. They have committed privately to me and I'm sure would have no problem agreeing to a condition of approval, $100,000 to a redevelopment account managed by Councilman Garcetti's office earmarked by, for sidewalk curb, corner ramp repair Thank and you, resident, I'm, one sentence, uh, resident re retaining walls affected by tree roots and age. Best thing for this neighborhood is to approve the project. Thank you. You can shorter as it keep going faster. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Jenny Dugan, John Wilborn, uh, and then Kristen Lanner. Please. Uh, Judy Dugan, 403 North Bronson Avenue. I'm a member of the Larchmont Village Neighborhood Association. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. It's been endless. Uh, we do appreciate the fact that uh, the Martini Lounge is gone, uh, along with its associated problems. We do understand in our neighborhood that uh, this condo development is probably an appropriate use of the land, but we do not support uh, any kind of condos at any size. Uh, the developer is asking for too much density, too much height, uh, a, a virtual wedding cake. We have not seen scale models. Uh, they have not been 
uh, kind enough to share any kind of scale model with us and have only described it uh, in terms that they wished we would accept. Uh, there is no reason for a development uh, larger than what the Planning Commission has approved. We, uh, I certainly believe that they can build the condo development uh, that the Planning Commission approved, uh, but not the larger one. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Wellborn, Kristen Lanner, and Mern Gentel. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. I'm John Wellborn, a letter from the Windsor Square Association, of which I'm the Vice President for Planning and Land Use, has been uh, submitted supporting the staff and the Planning Commission. Um, I thought my uh, friend Jerry Newman made a very good presentation, and my friends at Sorrell have been doing a great job for them. I would point out that the file does have a current memo dated May 20th of 2008 that has a lot of support from neighbors. But if you go and look at some of that support, it goes back to the days when there was the huge nuisance of the Larchmont nightclub, the Martini Bar. And everybody two years ago, and a lot of people a year ago, were very supportive of getting rid of it. That doesn't mean they've actually seen what is being presented. Now you see a lot of people from the various neighborhood councils who have seen it. The key here is it really is a precedent. There is an existing plan, and that plan is what should be followed, not what could be in a future plan. And so I think it's important to stick with the planning staff if we're going to believe in planning. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Kristen Lauder, Brian Zentel, Patricia Carroll, Michael Gilman, and Jenny Chow. That should conclude. Kristen Lauder is part of the uh, applicant team is there to answer questions. Okay. How about Myrna Gentel? Um, hello. My name is Myrna Gentel. I live at 334 South Rimpaw Boulevard in Hancock Park. I'm a member of the Hancock Park Historical Society and the um, Hancock Park Homeowners Association. And um, I also am against, well, let's say I'm, I'm for development in the community, but I think that it should be uh, what the Planning Commission did originally uh, suggest and not for these additional uh, uh, requests that the applicant has applied for. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Patricia Carroll then Michael Gilman. Uh, my name is Patricia Carroll. I'd like to submit two letters. Please. Uh, I'm a director on the Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council. I'm a member of the Largemont Boulevard Association and I am on the board of directors of St. Andrew's Square Neighborhood Association. Um, I'll speak in this part for the St. Andrew's Square Neighborhood Association. Um, we realize that the development lies just outside our council district boundaries, but its major impact will be on Largemont Village, which is in our local council area, CD4. The nature of this, that impact threatens to be profound. Our association supports responsible and sustainable development, but the variances requested for the Camerford lofts would increase height and density while decreasing setback. It is quite clear that these variances, if allowed, would bring a number of negative consequences to our beloved Largemont Strip. Negative impacts would likely include, but not be limited to, some rather dire effects on traffic, as well as other visual and environmental environmental degradations, even Thank a you, blocked ma view of the Hollywood Hills. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyway, we oppose speaker. the developer's appeal and go with what the planning. Thank department. you, ma'am. Next speaker. Hi, this is Mike Gilman, 4941 Elmwood Avenue, and I'm also on the board of the Larchman Village Neighborhood Association. I'm in support of the Planning Commission's decision uh, that this should be uh, R3 or RAS3 still in terms of zoning and no more than uh, 45 feet, otherwise uh, too dense a project for the neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, and the last speaker is Robert Blue. Oh, Ms. Chow, please, come on up. I'm sorry, I jumped the gun here. Yeah, Jenny name, Chow. Yeah, my name is Jenny Chow. I live at 424 North Beachwood since 1975. So I'm opposed to variance and I just want the developer just to stick with the city you know, the development, tell the heights and everything. Okay? Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Robert Blue, that'll be our last speaker. Then I'll be asking the council office to step up. 
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Robert Blue. I'm the chairperson of the Hollywood Student District Neighborhood Council, but I left my neighborhood council sat, hat on the seat. I'm speaking as an individual today. Um, I, I uh, am, am against uh, several reasons against this project. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out is that I really think it works. I'm surprised to hear what the, ha the housing corporation said because we're actually going backwards. We had 48 low-income affordable units on the property. And, uh, and that's being taken off now. We have four market rate for profit. And I don't think um, the city should be in the business of telegraphing. I, you know, I blame myself, too, as I'm, I'm an elected official of the neighborhood council. Um, I don't think we should be telegraphing that we're going to be granting variances for these things. Just And on several uh, occasions at, the, uh, at meetings of our plum committee and our neighborhood council, uh, the developer stated that they needed a certain amount of density and a certain configuration to make the project profitable. And I don't think we should be in the business to make this profitable for the, for the developer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Sir, <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> okay. Ms. Bernard. Hello, council members. Uh, Kelly, <laughs> Kelly Bernard, Director of Planning and Economic Development for Council President Eric Garcetti. Um, we have heard a lot about um, this project. It is at the intersection of um, various uh, community or neighborhood community groups and neighborhood councils. We have um, worked closely with the neighborhood council that it sits in. Um, my predecessors had um, started this process some two years ago. And so we are here today um, in support of the applicant's revised uh, project request and variance request, and I will go through those um, very particularly, um, that they have reached with the Hollywood Studio District Neighborhood Council. Um, we have listened to the concerns of the community, and they include but are not limited to the proposed height, the amount of density, the compatibility with the neighborhood, and the existing blight. So you've talked, they've, some have talked about the Martini Lounge and some of the other blighted conditions, and uh, weighing the need for additional housing. Um, we still um, support this project. Early on when it was brought to our office, we worked um, with the developer to encourage um, the project so that it would not impact both on Camerford and Melrose. And so when the idea of pushing the density over the alley was broached with us, uh, we were supportive of that. We did have concerns about the RAS4 um, zone change. And after meeting with uh, myself and my predecessors, meeting with uh, city planning staff, Madhu Kumar, uh, Kumar in particular, and understanding that and talking with the community and their strong objection to setting precedent, uh, we advised the, um, the following the CPC uh, commission hearing, we advised the applicant that we would not be in support of the RIS-4 and that we would support the um, commission's decision um, and that was, and our, the caveat was, if you can do, or you can increase the density of the project by maintaining the RAS3 RAS on Melrose, let us see the project, and then take that back to the neighborhood council. Uh, we were not sure that you could do that just from the planning standpoint. The applicant has been able to achieve that greater density at the 85 units without changing the density, I mean, without changing the zone change, and they did go back again and present that to their neighborhood council, and they received that support. Um, so we And so we are in support of the applicant's request to average the density over the project parcels and to allow for building over the alley by, and, and improving the alley. Uh, there's been much talk about the height. Um, as we understand it, the height on Melrose will be 48 feet, which is three feet taller than what is being built across the street. So we were trying to be consistent um, with what's going on on Melrose. On the Camerford side, the Camerford frontage will be 29 feet, which is below what um, is, is permitted. The height um, that there will be up to 50 feet will be this portion over the alley which the council uh, men was comfortable with it being limited to that. So what you're seeing is basically looking like a wedding cake and that it's going to staircase up. Um, the project is meeting the required uh, setbacks that the, uh, the commission um, set forth and the applicant did talk about. Um, affordable housing, there has been much discussion about affordable housing and um, on-site versus off-site. 
with any project that comes before our office, we ask about affordable housing. Our preference is for this affordable housing to be on site. And so the very early discussions with this developer was about providing anywhere from 3% to 10% of affordable housing on site. Um, there was an uh, agreement reached where they would provide 10 per, up to 10% affordable housing off site. Um, it became apparent that um, to do this off-site it was about how do you determine where it's going to be off-site the developer proposed working with HCHC it was not at the suggestion of the council office um, we are familiar with HCHC um, but that arrangement was made um, outside of our office we were just concerned about making sure that there was affordable housing there was an affordable housing component to this project um, as been discussed, there was um, existing bungalow housing on the site. Um, the developer um, is working with HCHC, and they, as they talked about themselves, they are restoring and rehabbing four historic bungalow court apartments, which will provide homeless housing and 16-unit project for homeless and at-risk homelessness families. Um, and so we'll um, address that. Both of the projects that are being developed by HCHC will contain social services for the residents and will be restricted as affordable housing for a period of 55 years, which is generally longer than what the housing department requires at 30 years. Um, and finally, um, we have a list of some of the particular zone variances that have been requested. So our, our support of this project is for the applicant's um, appeal with modified condition, and those include a zone change to RIS-3, the um, variance to permit 38 residential units in the RIS-3-1 zone, a variance to permit a maximum of 50 feet in lieu of the um, R 30 feet that's allowed in the R3-XL. Um, and approval of the vesting tentative track map and uh, to, to sustain the commission's approval of the uh, various um, setbacks. And if you have any questions, I'm... Okay. Uh, if, um, one is what I find intriguing here is that there seems to be a disconnect between what the commission was observing and recommending given all the work you've been doing as an office for two years and it just seems to me they did not fold in the work that the council office was achieving with the community uh, stakeholders. That's just the impression I'm getting, given the direction of your recommendations, which is, uh, to me, something we just got to keep working on. Um, we, I'm sorry. We are, um, the, the applicant can address about the commission, but I think this community is in the process of the community plan update process, so it is in the middle of, of transition to where, plan. and so it is a question of where we're going to end up. I think um, where our office um, disagreed um, strongly with the commission is with the ability um, and our um, support of building over the alley. I think that in itself is where. But that was the pivotal point. I'm sorry? That was the pivotal point. Yes, okay. that, that was the pivotal but, point. But the fact is uh, you're going to continue working with the community through the community plan process. Absolutely. To start shaping the future and the vision of this corridor. And, and, and a process that will hopefully bring um, consensus about where this community is going to go and okay. how, again, this site will be is adjacent. It's the southern end of the Hollywood community plan while it's the, at the northern tip of the Wilshire community plan. And they have very, those two plans have very different visions for what Melrose is going to look like. So we will be working throughout this voice. process. I, I just want to concur with what the chair said. Um, that what I've seen here uh, is, and you, and you mentioned your predecessor, we're familiar with her here. Uh, you and she and Councilmember Garcetti have done extensive outreach for the past several years on this project, trying to work things out. And I think the applicant and the applicant's representatives have done that as well. And, uh, and I appreciate that. So uh, our action would be to help me out here, Madam Attorney. <laughs> I'll get the verbiage here. Is to, uh, uh, again, uh, the you're going to need to, Jerry Bridge, City Attorney's Office. You're going to need to take an action on the appeals, whether you're granting or denying or modifying, um, and you're going to need to state what the zoning is, um, and perhaps planning can help you. I I really well, not we, sure I can our, our I can motion, be the one to help you. Well, well let's put it together. Well, uh, the, the, most, the motion that I, that I think we want to make is to 
um, approve the recommendations set forth by CD 13. And I'll leave it to all of you to figure out which is the granting and which is the denial. Uh, just correct? so you know, the applicant submitted a, 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 a some appeal to the modification to the conditions, and they're dated June 3rd, and they're on your desk. There are, there's a number of pages. I don't, I'm not sure that the council office had, had an opportunity to look at these requests for the conditions because they were submitted to me today. Oh. So I don't know if we're acting on those right now. All right, Councilman, the best I can tell is as to appeal number one from Camerford, you are Melrose Camerford Avenue, you are granting in part and denying in part. As to appeal number two from um, Douglas Haynes on behalf of La Mirada, you are denying that appeal. As to the appeal uh, filed by Melrose Camerford 8B on the tract map, you are granting in part and denying in part because you will have to modify some conditions, in particular the uh, density. I just want to make certain for the record that the conditions we're modifying are the conditions that were submitted by the applicant today. That's my clarification request. Council members, what I have and uh, what I uh, passed on to staff is a list of our understanding of what the approvals will be, what the approvals will be. And then there are seven of them, um, I, and they tr it's our attempt to kind of codify the, you know, agenda items eight and B and what their approvals will be. Um, I can go through them or I can give them to, to No, as staff. long as I have them. I just want to make sure because I have several conditions before me and whatever ones we send to I council. I can submit I want this for sure their record. Well, well, let's make sure we, we're all on the same page. Um, I want to follow the city attorney's advice on the language that's been proposed based on the conditions submitted by the council. Yes. So those conditions could fit within those uh, uh, elements that are were denied in, in part, correct? Again, for the record, Jerry Burge, as to 8A1, that is the first appeal by Melrose Camerford Avenue, you are granting in part and denying in part and, and making modifications that will be submitted to the clerk. Right. As to 8A2, the appeal from Douglas Haynes on behalf of La Mirada, you are denying. Okay, that will be the action of this committee. And as to, excuse me, 8B, which is the appeal by Melrose Camerford Avenue on the tract map, you are granting in part and denying in part and modifying conditions. That case. will be given to the clerk. Yes. Okay. And those are articulated in that motion. Okay. So that will be the action of this committee on this item. Thank you. All right. Our next item, Roberto. <clears throat> Next item, Councilman, is an appeal by Jeff Harding. Uh, he's appealing the action of the West LA APC, which approved um, various land use entitlements, a specific plan from the Venice Coastal Zone specific plan, and it's to permit three dwelling units in lieu of two dwelling units, and also zero parking spaces in lieu of five parking spaces. And Mr. <coughs> Avila is present. Okay, Mr. Avila, good afternoon. Yes, uh, for the record, Ralph Avila for Planning Department. Uh, this was a request that staff originally recommended denial. Um, however, at the uh, hearing with the West LA Area Planning Commission, in their deliberation, they felt that um, it was best to maintain the third unit that the applicant was requested, requesting and to grant the uh, not providing the five parking spaces that was also required by the specific plan, but in lieu of those by parking spaces, uh, they recommended that the applicant provide an in-lieu fee of $18,000 per space. I'm sorry, Mr. Avila, this is a historic moment, so I want to capture this. And it's hard to hear <laughs> when you got folks uh, walking out the chamber. So just pause for a second. It's hard to hear the, the voice as it <laughs> echoes through the chamber. Thank you. Can you proceed? Okay, so um, in lieu of the five parking spaces that the applicant asked not to provide, the APC uh, re required that they provide 
two park, I mean, in lieu fees for two parking spaces, uh, and the in lieu fee was $18,000 per space. Um, in, in the recommendation uh, before you, I miscalculated that amount. I put down 32000 when in fact it should have been 36000 So if the committee upholds the APC's recommendation, then I ask that that correction be made. Okay. And the appellant and the applicant are here. So let's hear from the uh, appellant. Just give us your name and address. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Jeffrey Harding, and I'm representing the concerned neighbors in a 500-foot radius. And I would like to hand you this uh, letter from some of the concerned neighbors in the 500-foot radius. And we're just asking for some semblance of a plan. Uh, Abbott Kinney had a plan. Ruth Galaner had a plan. Marvin Browd even had a plan. And now we're, we're going off in a direction that's kind of unknown. Our council person today has a person here, Whitney Bloomfield. And I asked her what the definition of a plan is, and she couldn't give me an answer. Um, we've come to a compromise in, in what we originally wanted, and all we're asking for is that we do not allow people to live in garages. Living in garages will lead to what we saw in New York, where a uh, uh, housing uh, boarding house caught on fire. We're going to have nothing but a disaster if we let people move into garages. So we're in agreement of letting Mr. Gorman have his illegal additional unit, but he has to keep his garage a garage and his exterior parking space an exterior parking space. And that'll be the best for the fire department and the density issues for the whole neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, sir. This is the only appellant on record. Uh, yes, Councilman. Okay, then let's hear from the other speakers. We have uh, Jan Kramiski, Sean Horman, Callie Wallace, and then John Parker. Hello, I'm Jan Kramiski. I'm a uh, resident, uh, 2126th Avenue, apartment three. I live in Venice, and I'm here speaking on behalf of Mr. Gorman, not on behalf, but in support of Mr. Gorman. Um, I'm here because I live in a building that's very similar to this one. It's actually almost identical. It's not, it's under parked. Um, actually, there's no parking, and there's four units where there should only be two, um, but it's legal. And in fact, most Venice apartment buildings are like this. It's a very common situation there, and it's kind of what makes the city the way it is, because it gives us a good diversity of housing, and it allows for people of many ethnic groups and of, of different income levels to live together in a community. And it's part of what gives us our diversity. And we're losing that, because Venice is becoming a, a highly desirable neighborhood. There's lots of people moving in, and it's gentrifying. So um, I'm asking, uh, I'm, I'm actually here just to, to ask you to help preserve existing rental housing, which is what this is. This has been there for since the 50s, and just let it stay as is. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker. After me, I'm John Parker, representative for the applicant. Uh, the applicant uh, agrees with all aspects of the West LA Area Planning Commission determination, including all its findings and all its conditions of approval. Uh, the applicant is only the most recent in, in a long line of, of owners of this property going back more than 50 years. The property was built back in the 50s and has existed with, with four dwellings as far back as, as the 1950s as evidenced by the, the county assessor's records. When Mr. Gorman moved in five years ago, he immediately reduced it from four dwellings down to three, which is the existing uh, three dwellings, which is what the Area Planning Commission approved and what Mr. Gorman intends to, to retain. Um, the um, commission in granting the three dwellings uh, also approved the two existing functional parking spaces. Even though the request was technically for zero parking, there's actually two existing usable functional spaces, and the applicant volunteered to buy two more spaces by in lieu fees under the Venice specific plan. And the commission's reasons for approving were to uh, retain affordable housing, to not displace the existing tenant, 
uh, because of the, and the, the development is consistent with the surrounding development and there's no additional impacts, it has existed as it now is again for the last half century. I should also mention that the Neighborhood Council approved the request for three dwellings uh, uh, previously. We respectfully request that the uh, thank city, you, sir. thank you very much, that thank the City Council uh, approve the, uh, the APC's thank you, sir. action. Kelly Wallace and Sean Gorman. Good afternoon. I'm Sean Gorman. I'm the owner of the property. Uh, I think John did a pretty good job of summarizing the case in terms of the, the technical aspects. So what I'd like to do is just take a moment to present the case from my perspective, which is the personal perspective, and also as a, a Venice resident. In order to do that, there's three things I'd like to talk about. The first are the impacts of this case on me personally. The second are the impacts on Kim Newman, who's the resident living in the back converted unit right now. And the third are the impacts to the Venice community, just in general. So in order to do that, we'll start with me. For me, firstly, I think it's most important to understand when we're talking about 543 Grand Boulevard, we're talking about my home. It's not an apartment building. It's not an investment property. This is my primary residence. I've lived there for the last six years. And up until this case was filed, I had no intent or even thought of ever having to leave my home. And now, I, for the last, this has been going on for almost two years. And I find myself questioning whether or not I'm going to be able to continue to live in my home based on the findings of uh, city rulings. So in essence, without the rental income from these two units, I'm sorry if I go over the time here, but without the income from these two rental units, it becomes infeasible for me to continue to live at the property. And I'm essentially forced out. And uh, you know, it, it leads me to the question of if I'm forced out, then <coughs> can I continue to live in the area? I need you to summarize. Summarize. Okay. Kim Newman is the resident in the back. Her story is pretty much the same. If the case is overturned, Kim Newman loses her home. Okay. She's been there for some time. We have 18 letters of support. One of the letters is from her. In her letter, she states two things. One is obviously in support of this case to retain the use as it's existed for the last 50 years. The second thing she brings up is her concern over being able to find affordable housing in the area, comparable unit to what she lives in right now at the price she's paying. And quite honestly, those concerns are valid. When you look out, I mean, you guys are probably familiar with the rental market, and I forwarded the link with Craigslist rental listings. You see very high rents out in the market. Thank A per you. perfect example, nine units up from our building on Rialto, 580 Rialto. Um, so it's one street over, nine buildings up. One bedroom rent, they're asking 2550 a month in rent. It's, Thank and you, And that's sir. an average unit. Thank you. Okay. So the final piece of this, and I'm sorry, again, just to summarize, the final piece of this is if I can't make the property work as an owner-occupied space, then it puts me in the uncomfortable position where I'm looking to sell. And if I sell, the guy who's coming in isn't going to be able to do any better than I'm doing. So really the highest and best use of this project becomes a development site and you Thank get you, a sir. large single family home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, last, Kelly Wallace. And Thank you, sir. Point, I have letters of support that were included. Please. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm here today to support the case at 543 Grand Boulevard. Um, as both Sean and Mr. Parker have pointed out, this garage unit was recognized by the LA County Assessor in 1959. And to just get, put that in perspective of how long this unit has been there in terms of how the neighborhood has already been impacted by the density and the parking, in 1959, the um, Fidel Castro became the premier of Cuba. In 1959, Barbie was introduced onto the market. This unit has been here for a very long time. And I would argue that anything, any impact that's been made on the neighborhood has already been felt, if it felt at all. Um, and on a more personal note, I just want to say um, that this building is my home and um, that a vote against this project is a vote against um, the approval of the Venice Neighborhood Council who approved this project, the LAPC, and also a vote against us to live in our home and to continue to live in the Venice neighborhood. This um, case has been present in our lives for the past two years, and I can't um, you know, begin to speak to you about the amount of stress that has been introduced to our lives that we may be losing our home. So um, I just ask you to really take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Reyes. I'm sorry, we already went through the different um, cards and 
Um, Ms. Wendy Blumenthal. And as, as you come up, Ms. Blumenthal, because I lost quorum, uh, this will be a report from the chair to the council uh, when it comes to the council. So we might have to do this one more time. Right, that was my understanding, thank you. So good afternoon, Councilman. For the record, Whitney Blumenfeld, CD11. As we've heard, the property in question has been more than two units since 1960. Um, the person who's owning the property has paid in lieu fees. The councilman does support maintaining the preservation of the three units in order to not decrease the number of housing units in the Venice community, thus opposing the appeal. Thank you. Okay. So I'm trying again to find the right language that gets us to. So the motion would be to, to maintain so we would deny the appeal. Okay. So that'll be the action of this committee. And um, the correction on the in lieu fees. Right. So that also means, Mr. Avila, that uh, you will have to grace us with your presence in the city council <laughs> uh, when this comes back. No, I'm serious. Come up to the microphone. <laughs> Because there is no quorum, we're going to need you to report to the council on this case. Okay. And we'll have to take a vote there. And the actual report will go. <laughs> Someone's really enjoying this. <laughs> okay. And it'll be a written report to the council, and we'll make a decision there. All right. So again, you could just keep practicing. And you're doing All great. Right. Okay. Is this the last time? Yes. Oh, I'm just making a momentous occasion. Okay. <laughs> All right, folks. So that will be the action of this committee. It'll, it'll be the recommendation of, or report from this chair to uh, deny the appeal and to maintain the three units. Thank you. Anybody have a public comment? The three units weren't in question, it's just the garage. Right. We, we, the way it's been defined in the report is we're going to support the three units. Very good. Maybe we can ask. It's confusing because the three units can stay. Well, well, let me do this. Let me finish this off first. Anybody have a public comment? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned. Attending so many meetings. <laughs>